Good morning and welcome to the 34th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to switch off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. The first item on the agenda today is an evidence session on Article 50 withdrawal negotiations and this morning we're taking evidence from Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business Constitutional and Constitutional Relations and Officials, Ellen Lever, the Head of Negotiations Strategy and Delivery, and Alan Johnson, Deputy Director of EU External Readiness uh, at the Scottish Government. Can I thank you all for coming this morning and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement? Thank you very much indeed and my apologies in advance. I'm not only stuffed up with the cold but I was in London as many of you know yesterday and um, I'm sort of deaf in one ear at the present moment as a result of that experience. So if I don't hear you, I'm sure you will speak loudly. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, 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 to give evidence here today. Uh, this is my third Christmas as the member of the government with responsibility for Brexit. And it seems very strange that we are three years in and yet things are still so chaotic and difficult to understand. I suppose one might use the word nebulous about them. Um, I've come before this committee at various stages of the negotiations and in recent weeks, the attention has turned very much to Westminster. It is very sobering to think that we are now less than 100 days away from potentially leaving the EU, and we still have no more clarity about what awaits us. We have a false dichotomy in the choice that is being offered by the Prime Minister between her deal, which would be disastrous for Scotland, and a no deal, which would also be disastrous for Scotland. We've rejected that false dichotomy. And I hope that today we can talk about the other options that exist uh, and also about uh, why we have come to this pass. Um, there has been turmoil within the Conservative Party and there remains turmoil at uh, Westminster. Uh, a sensible government, and we are a sensible government, has had to prepare for no deal, but very much with the hope that we will not have to implement those plans. And in addition to the meeting of the JMC plenary, which I uh, attended with the First Minister yesterday in Downing Street, I also had meetings with other UK government ministers about uh, the issues of no deal. Our preferred outcome from this at the present moment is to have a referendum, that is give, to give people the chance and not to have a second thought but to pass judgment on the chaos of the last uh, two and a half years and to think very carefully about where they see their future lying. That second referendum would offer people the opportunity to make that choice uh, and there is a clear route to that which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, we have continued to publish information and most recently we published our assessment of the uh, Prime Minister's uh, so-called deal and you will have a copy of that and clearly I hope it informs your discussion. Um, there remains time, even at this very late hour, to galvanise the political will and to say that what has taken place over the last two years has been a massive mistake, undertaken with complete incompetence by uh, a government which is out of time and out of date. And the opportunity exists to do something better. And we would like to see that something better being remaining within the EU. Okay, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I start off by going back to the withdrawal agreement and the political uh, declaration? Obviously, the withdrawal agreement, uh, if it was ratified, is a legally binding document between the EU and the UK, but the political declaration doesn't have that status. And uh, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what the political what your view is of the content of the political de declaration and what it might mean for Scotland in terms of the future UK-EU relationship? The political declaration, uh, as you know, convener, is very vague and very aspirational, uh, and there are many parts of it in which uh, things are, are essentially sought to happen without it, any indication whether they could happen. I think though, if you read the political declaration, you are very much struck by the fact that there is no clarity about what will take place next, and that's a crucial issue. The Prime Minister tells, uh, and yesterday wished to tell the devolved administrations that we should listen to the voice of business, which is rather curious given the, uh, for example, the CBI's view of the um, what, um, um, migration white paper that was published yesterday, which no doubt we will want to come on to. But business has an expectation and a need for certainty. The Prime Minister's agreement does not provide certainty in any sense. And indeed, I thought that was very clear yesterday from some of the debate that were taking place in the House of Commons. There is no certainty out of this. Uh, there is a, a withdraw legally binding withdrawal agreement which gets you to the starting gate, 
of saying what will the future relationship be, but then what that future relationship will be will be the subject of the most incredible, complex and detailed negotiations. Moreover, once again, the timescale for those negotiations has been completely misstated by the UK government. The expectation which the Prime Minister is, is clinging to is that this will be concluded by the end of December 2020. That is utterly impossible. Uh, that Mr Barnier, for example, has indicated that there would be 10 strands of negotiation. Uh, what we've been through has been meant to be the easy part. So there is no certainty, and there is no certainty of an outcome. And one of the, the, the worrying things about this is the no-deal preparations with which we are regrettably deeply engaged at the present moment, and which I updated the Chamber about on Tuesday, those no-deal preparations will have to be kept on ice for however long the discussions take with, in terms of a future relationship, because they could be needed at any time we could find ourselves at the stage with no agreement. So if anybody is backing the Prime Minister's deal simply out of, and I fully understand it, out of essentially the scunner factor that we have just had enough of this, and we better just do this and get on with it, they're not even going to have the satisfaction of saying, well, at least that's over. The actual fact is just about to start. Okay, and in terms of these negotiations, what role do you see the Scottish Government having in these relation, the, the negotiations about the future relationship? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you will realise that my experience over the last two and a half years has made me somewhat cynical. I didn't used to be like this, but I've sort of got there. Um, I, there are constant assertions from the UK government that things are going to change. Uh, the word intensification has been used, I think, on every second month for the last two and a half years, and, and we're hearing it again, that if this, the Prime Minister's deal does get through, then there will be a reset uh, of the negotiations between ourselves and, and the UK. And they will require to uh, see our uh, integral involvement because the, much of the negotiation will deal with devolved areas of competence. Um, I don't doubt the, the, the word of many people who say that, but I have been pretty astonished over the last two and a half years about the lack of knowledge of and understanding of devolution in most UK government departments. And I think that although there may be a commitment from one or two people to do things better, I think it will ground pretty quickly on that lack of knowledge and that uh, uh, inability to understand a key fact of devolution, which I keep banging on about, but I'll do it again. There is no hierarchy of governments in devolution. There is a hierarchy of parliaments in devolution. You know, and devolution is essentially a, a set of compromises built around the... Um, view of the Westminster Parliament of itself, that it is sovereign. I won't go into my own views of that, but that is what devolution is. It is not about one government being able to second-guess or gainsay another government. And indeed, what we saw with the Continuity Bill was an attempt to interpret devolution in that way, and it didn't succeed, and the Supreme Court would not allow devolution to be interpreted in that way. So I, uh, I think that there would be, theoretically, a need to do things better, it will be tied up within the process of the intergovernmental review, which is presently underway, uh, though not making any progress, as far as I can see. And that is a review which the JMC process is committed to reviewing intergovernmental relations in the light of the experience of devolution. And that, m one would have hoped, would have led to something better. But I'm not hopeful. Thank you. I want to move on now to the differentiated deal, uh, possibility of a differentiated deal for Northern Ireland. Uh, you've indicated in the past that that could put Scotland at an economic disadvantage. Can I ask us the Scottish Government uh, plans to do any economic assessment or modelling of that scenario? Well, we have done some partial modelling in the sense that the material which we produced in Scotland's place in Europe in all its iterations uh, indicates what the effect of a differentiated deal would be on us. Uh, I think there is scope to do more with the Northern Ireland situation, and certainly officials are uh, and will discuss that and are discussing that. I think there's an extraordinary irony in the present situation that the, 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 the DUP, uh, speaking for the people of Northern Ireland, which of course it doesn't in, in, in completely, uh, is desperate to oppose the deal, whereas in actual fact the bulk of political opinion in, in Northern Ireland is to accept the deal uh, on the grounds that it gives Northern Ireland a very, very special status and essentially keeps it within the single market. Uh, of course, the, the opposite remains true in Scotland, uh, that the Conservatives are desperately keen to have the deal, but in the reality the deal as offered Scotland is very, very much poorer uh, and would be immensely disadvantageous. Very much. And now move on to the Deputy Convener, Claire Baker. 
Um, thank you, convener. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has described the present situation in front of us as a false dichotomy. And we had the statement last week around the Court of Justice ruling about the um, ability of the UK Government to revoke Article 50. Um, I'd asked some questions at the time around that, and so I'd like the Cabinet Secretary to... I think when we asked the questions in Chamber last week, you said there was no um, constitutional arrangement within... There's no written constitution within the UK that would make it clear what the stages would be to revoking. And when the committee visited Brussels um, at the start of the month, um, in discussions that we had, it was made clear that if the, gov the UK government were to request to revoke, it would have to be on a significant basis, it couldn't be used as a tactic. So if the Cabinet Secretary could maybe say more about how he could see that process happening, and then, if it was to happen, what the stages after that would be, because I feel that uh, the UK is still <coughs> divided over this issue, and there's a question about whether there's any greater certainty if a revocation was to go ahead, of where that would then lead us to. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> Undoubtedly, the, the divisions that exist are, are great and profound, but I don't accept the argument that we should simply accept those divisions that exist, paper them over with the Prime Minister's deal and pretend that everything is fine. I mean, if you, if you accept that this, the result in 2016 was bought on a false prospectus, if you accept, as seems likely now, there was a great deal of chicanery involved, and if you accept that the actions of the UK government since then have been extraordinarily uh, I mean, mind-bogglingly inept, then I don't think just saying, well, we'll just put all that behind us is going to produce any sort of unity whatsoever. So I'm not convinced by the Prime Minister's argument uh, for unity. Um, I, I do think that... I don't think there is any template for what constitutional due process would be. Uh, I think that there is likely to be a series of actions that could be taken which would be seen to be, by the EU27, to be constitutional due process. I think, um, given the way that the House of Commons has operated, a resolution of the House of Commons to uh, revoke Article 50, uh, because it was a resolution of the House of Commons that invoked Article 50, if you remember, the, the Prime Minister tried to stop that happening uh, and lost that legally, uh, uh, would be effective. It would seem to me it would be even more effective if there was a referendum based upon that basis. And I think it is likely that there could be a suspension of Article 50, and of course that exists within the treaty, uh, potential for a six-month extension. Up to six months, should I say, extension. I think if that were requested, it would be likely to be granted on the basis of either an election or a referendum. So I think that route is reasonably clear. Um, but I think it would be wrong to look for... Something that was um, uh, you know, absolutely the, the right way to do this and that there were wrong ways to do it. Um, I think the House of Commons would have a strong role to play in it. Uh, but I think we would want to see a democratic will expressed. I, when I came into this post in August 2016, I was very struck early on by the fact that the EU was very focused on constitutional due process in terms of where Scotland's position was. And I, produced a, I had produced a, a little booklet on the constitution as it operated with Scotland and within the UK, because it is difficult you know, for people within the EU to understand uh, that if there is no written constitution, there is still an understanding of how the constitution operates, and it is still possible to seek legal uh, 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 judgment about aspects of the constitution, not that we have a constitutional court, uh, and that was clear from the Supreme Court judgment. So I think my, my answer, I've developed that answer to, to, uh, since last week, uh, to think that there isn't a single right track, but if I were to think what the best track would be, it would be a resolution in the House of Commons. I don't think it could just be a letter from the Prime Minister, um, and uh, double locking that with a referendum result might be the right thing to do. And um, the other, when we went to Europe, um, we went over to Brussels, the committee, for a couple of days. Uh, it was quite interesting, and I think it gave us a better understanding of the EU27's view on the situation that we're in. Do you think the political discussion in uh, Scotland and in the UK is aware enough of the eu 27s views? And to go back to the convener's question around Northern Ireland, I, mean, I think they did make it quite clear that Northern Ireland was a unique set of circumstances. Uh, the deal was to uphold the Good Friday Agreement, um, and they were largely opposed to any other kind of regional variations that, and discussed what that would mean for the rest of the 27, if they were to start introducing 
um, different arrangements in different parts of a member state? I think if you go back to the start of this process, I think Monsieur Barnier was clear that were the UK to come to the negotiating table with a set of arrangements which made differentiation, for example, for Wales or for Scotland, that would be what the UK wished to achieve and would become part of the negotiating process. It was the UK that chose not to do that. It is not the place of the, of the EU to do that. Clearly, that would be impossible. But you know, this, this goes back to the way in which the UK approached these negotiations from the very beginning. Uh, it approached them in an amateurish, thoughtless way, and it approached them also in the view, if you remember the Prime Minister's uh, words, that we entered the EU as one UK and would leave as one UK. I mean, I, I've described that regularly as constitutional illiteracy. Uh, that, that simply is not the case. Uh, the constitution has changed since the UK joined the EU. There is a different constitution, and that should be recognised. You know, devolution has taken place since then. So what the UK should have done is gone into negotiations recognising the reality of devolution. And you know, one of the I think I think it was Ryan Heath who who wrote last weekend in a very uh, I think important contribution to this. You could list the things that the Prime Minister has failed to do, which have created the present extraordinary mess. And you would probably start by saying, at a very early stage, she should have taken, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, um, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, Nicholas Sturgeon, um, Carwin at that time, uh, Arlene Foster. Uh, actually at that stage, uh, Martin and Arlene, into a room and said, how can we together get this to work? How, you know, this is the imperative we think we have. But we recognise, for example, that Scotland has voted against. We recognise that Northern Ireland has voted against. How do we get this to work? At no time did that take place. At no time was there anything other than we do it my way, according to the Prime Minister, and nobody else matters. And that is at the heart and root of the problem that we presently have. And how then anybody can talk about bringing people together when their actions at the very beginning have forced people apart, I do not know. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Annabelle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Um, so picking up on the, the, the where we are at the moment, or where we think we are at the moment, so it seems to me that the Prime Minister is engaged in, in an extraordinary act of brinkmanship. Um, I, I suppose her tactic must be to hope that with uh, 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 the fears of no deal that she gets um, some change of, of mind in the House of Commons. But equally, it seems that the House of Commons is, is hostile to this deal. So therefore, in order for her to sway some of her own backbenchers, she would need to get the EU to do something different. But what is it that the EU could do differently? Because they've already made it clear uh, that they're, you know, they cannot change the withdrawal agreement itself, uh, which is a legal document, and the political declaration is linked there too. So there's actually quite limited room for manoeuvre, albeit not in quite the same way as the withdrawal agreement. So what is it that do you think she's holding out to her backbenchers to, to get this through? Because this is not just a question of political semantics. This is a question of whether we then go into a no-deal situation. I have no idea. I didn't get any indication yesterday of what that was. Uh, there seems to be a, a, a confidence that there is something there which can do so, but we were given no indication of, of what that could be. Uh, Jamie Green asked me a question uh, um, in the statement on Tuesday regarding this being the only deal which you know, and the EU saying it. I think it's important to reiterate this. This is the only deal because of the red lines that were set in the negotiating process. It is not, you know, in, 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 in the platonic concept, you know, it, the, the best of all possible deals. It, it is a deal that is dictated by the inputs, and the inputs were the red lines, and particularly the, the jurisdiction of the ECJ um, and uh, the end of freedom of movement. I mean, I, I think it is beyond bizarre that anybody can claim proudly that they have ended freedom of movement. I, I just, I find that my mind is blown by that concept. But that's what has driven this, the red lines. If you have those red lines, then you end up with this deal. That's where we are. And I think the EU probably is quite proud of itself. that has been able to, be, to create a coherent deal around an incoherent set of red lines. There is a, a slide from the Barnier Task Force, which you are familiar with, that shows in a step diagram uh, essentially what possible outcomes there are, depending on what red lines you set. And, you know, this has been clear from the very beginning. I think that slide must be 18 months old. 
you know, and, and that's been very clear from the beginning that you would get this outcome if you started there. Um, and that's what we've ended up with. Now, they're not going to change that because that's dictated by the red lines. If you go and take the red lines away, for example, if you take the four freedoms away and you say we will accept freedom of movement, in Scottish terms we should say that because we, we need freedom of movement, if you say that, you will get a different deal, you get a different outcome. Um, continued membership of the single market through the EEA becomes a, an option in those circumstances, as we've always said, because you observe the four freedoms. Um, if you accept the jurisdiction of the ECJ, you know, something else becomes, and actually get to the stage where membership is the right solution. But because of the red lines, the Prime Minister is where she is, and I have no idea what rabbit she believes she has to pull out of a hat. I think she may find that the rabbit has chewed its way through the hat and disappeared, but who knows? Well, indeed, we shall, we shall see. If we assume that the, the, the vote, if it does indeed take place on the 14th, <laughs> she seems to pull votes when she wants to, uh, but if that does go ahead on the 14th of January, and in fact the House of Commons does not support uh, the deal, Going back to, to Claire Baker's uh, points, uh, presumably then uh, there would be sufficient time to either seek an extension of Article 50 or unilaterally revoke Article 50 per the recent court judgment, because obviously we're coming up against the 29th of March, so that would avoid uh, the, 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 the worst of outcomes in terms of no deal. Time is very much of the essence. If the, you know, I mean, when the Prime Minister says we need to get on with it, she is the person who withdrew the vote. If she had allowed the vote to take place and if she'd been defeated, we would be into a understood process, which gave them 21 days to come back and then seven days to make a proposal. So, you know, the, the, the clock would have been set to get some movement. She decided not to do that. So if we get to the week beginning of the 14th and that takes place, then there's, you know, t I think a seven-day period that she then has to bring back something. That something is clear, and it was a point the First Minister made very forcibly yesterday at the JMC. That something could be done today, which is to say to the EU27, we want to take advantage of what is in the treaty, which is an extension of the Article 50 process, and here's why we want it. I don't think you would get it on the basis of we just, you know, I've been incompetent in negotiation, but you would get it on the basis of, of some significant change. And then, you know, businesses would then feel that there's some progress was being made, and politically you would be on a route to getting a solution to this. But until that vote takes place, that can't happen, and she is the person who delayed the vote. Yes, all very uh, gloomy at this point. Um, I do have questions on a different issue, uh, Commissioner, but perhaps we can let this flow a bit and come back. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Um, Tavish Scott, do you have anything you want to come Thank you. I, um, d yes, it's where you depart from commentary into a question on, on all this, because I take your analysis, Cabinet it's actually about uh, bringing all the leaders together, but um, uh, that would have split the Tory party at the time, of course, and, and that may be a very obje desirable objective from some of our perspectives, but I can see why that never happened, because... Uh, uh, but two things I wanted to ask. Um, Amber Rudd said last night on Peston that uh, for the first time, Cabinet Secretary basically said that uh, she supported a second uh, uh, well, people's vote, a second referendum. That, I thought, was the most important development of yesterday, not what went on in the Commons, but a Cabinet Secretary is now out there saying what I suspect is... So just your thoughts on that. And the other one, maybe rather more importantly in the longer term, because I thought we got this out of Brussels when we were there, um, Claire Baker's question, questioning. Um, Scotland House do a great job, but um, won't we need to increase that operation out there, given what's going to happen? I mean, Mike Nielsen and Ian Campbell and their team are excellent. I have nothing but my admiration, but, but they are so understaffed now, given what's likely to happen. Isn't that the case? Uh, well, I think there are strong arguments for increasing and continuing to increase our representation, not just in Brussels, but elsewhere, given the circumstances. Of course, we are constrained financially, and we have to recognise that. But I, I agree with you. I think the whole team does a fantastic job there. Uh, there are eyes and ears in Brussels, but there are also our ambassadors, and they're uh, doing a fantastic thing in showing people what Scotland's view is and, and how we... We have taken this forward. Um, we now have a presence in Paris. We have a presence in uh, Berlin. Uh, we have a presence in London, a very effective presence in London. And of course, we have a very effective presence in Dublin. We will need to do more, but within the, the, the constraints that we presently have. Um, just in terms of Anne Barud's contribution, yes, it is significant. But, you know, words have to be followed by actions. 
there needs to be a recognition. The cabinet is probably split. Well, who knows how many factions it is in, but it's probably split between those people who are might as well continue to support the prime minister on the grounds that they owe their careers to her. Those people who recognise that the people have to be heard at some stage on this, and those people who are determined to have a no deal, including that ludicrous concept of a managed no deal. I mean, if anybody has any doubt about the impossibility of that, then read the document that the Commission issued yesterday. There is no doubt at all. The Commission has thrown its hands up, essentially in horror, and said, we will do what we need to do to protect ourselves. You know, and that's not a managed no deal. That's saying, you know, we're not going to be derailed as a result of what's taking place here. Um, so if Amber Rudd is followed by others today who were to say, let's have a people's vote, I would be encouraged. But the, um, <coughs> uh, your point about the Commission paper that was published yesterday on their perspective on a no deal, um, are Scotland House fully engaged in that? I mean, uh, uh, they are. They're providing information and they're giving information. Uh, they are making sure that people are aware of our preparations. And, of course, we are in detailed discussion with the UK government and with the Welsh government and with the Northern Irish Civil Service, uh, all of whom I met with yesterday. I mean, I, I hope none of this happens, but so do I. Uh, the government, the UK government wrote to, what, 145,000 businesses across the UK, yeah. which I assume include a lot in Scotland. Yeah. W was the Scottish government involved? No, in the um, and there? it's a point I made to the Prime Minister directly yesterday, that we did not see the letter or the information pack before it went. We, uh, we uh, launched a, a toolkit um, in September or October, I think, um, on, for businesses, um, uh, and it's been very well received. An online toolkit that allowed people to work out what they were going to do. If you haven't seen it, I'm happy to circulate information <coughs> on it. Uh, and it's been well received and it's been helpful. Uh, but there have been communications that have not been checked with us, and therefore we have issues about it. The Welsh Government yesterday uh, raised the point that the Department of Health has been uh, saying things in Wales uh, and asking people to contact a Whitehall number, where in actual fact, of course, there is devolved uh, health administration in, in Wales. So we've got to guard against that. To be fair, and I want to be fair, uh, where difficulties have been arising, they have been raised, and there has been an attempt to try and solve them. Uh, so I think that that situation on no deal has improved over the last few weeks and months. But it needs to, because you know this is desperately serious stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, uh, convener. Moving on to what you are just discussing, Cabinet Secretary. You have identified, and we are aware, that many businesses in commerce and industry and many sectors already are dealing with contingencies in case we have a no-deal scenario. Uh, and they've been putting them in place, and you've touched on the toolkit that the Scottish Government have had. Uh, can I ask about what other guidance has been, and is that going to be published by the Scottish Government so that we can see what your preparations are uh, with reference to that? Well, I, I think we, I gave a, a comprehensive uh, outline of that to the Chamber on Tuesday. I undertook to write to members, and I'll make sure all members have that, on further details, including financial details. Uh, what we have done for businesses, we have done publicly. Uh, there's material um, in the toolkit and on further websites and other information that's provided. There is financial aid, which has been well publicised and which is available to businesses. So all that material is out there. Um, I, I'm not going to publish more documents uh, about... Uh, uh, no deal. I don't want a no deal to take place, and I want the focus, if it does, to be on making sure that we can mitigate as much as possible, and that is where we are. And that is, to be honest, where the UK government is as well. Um, there needs to be a coordination of message, and again, that's a subject I, I am addressing with the UK government, so that whatever the message is, it gets through. Um, I made the point yesterday, and I make it here again today, one of the key issues for Scotland in no-deal preparations is uh, the, we are at the end of the supply chain, um, and therefore the remote and rural parts of Scotland are particularly at risk. Uh, we also know that the effect of a no-deal would be particularly damaging to those who are most vulnerable in society, both in terms of rurality and geography and also in terms of demography. So we have to be prepared and ready for that, and that is something we are feeding into the system. But um, we will continue to report on to the Chamber on no-deal preparations. I also made a commitment on Tuesday. I'm happy to brief party leaders and party spokespeople on that, and of course I'm happy to brief committee conveners and committees as we do that. But I'm very keen that we get on with things. Uh, you know, we have a were this to happen, this would be an enormous task. 
And the, um, and the civil service, you know, we're, we're reallocating time and space. So we will be absolutely transparent. But I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time polishing documents. No. But as, as you have already indicated, it is a, a mammoth task uh, to <coughs> endeavour uh, to ensure that, that we have the contingencies in place, should they. Uh, and I still am of the opinion that a deal will happen, and, and I, I firmly believe that. Uh, but you have to have the contingency there to ensure, because as you have indicated, uh, the rurality, uh, the, the individuals who are at, at risk and those who are more vulnerable uh, require that support mechanism uh, to be there to ensure that they are protected uh, and feel protected uh, during the process. Uh, the, I mean, the UK has done, I think, about 105 uh, technical notices have been, have been issued uh, is it roughly the similar level that we would have here in Scotland? Well, I mean, what we've done is, uh, on a number of technical notices, we were able to inject into them at the very last uh, moment information that was of particular relevance to Scotland, or to indicate where the information was not of relevance to Scotland. <laughs> and, uh, and actually um, indicated where Scots law differed or information differed. So I wouldn't see these as specifically UK government notices. I mean, we had no control over the origins or editorialising of them, but where we were able to, we were able to make sure that their relevance was such that they would apply to Scotland. Uh, there have been I've indicated occasions where information has been provided to organisations by the UK which we believe we should have known about or done better, but uh, we're, not in a, we're not in a war of briefing on this, or a war of information. You know, and, and I've made it very clear, for example, when you look at public information, that the campaigns, if they happen, will have to be nested there will need to be a distinctive and relevant Scottish campaign, and work is well underway on that. There will be a distinct and relatively clear, very clear, uh, Scottish web presence and, and information available to us, but it will be nested within the message that's coming from the UK government so that there is no contradiction. There is a complementary approach, and I had that, you know, I've had that conversation at a high level, and we will continue to do that. But I don't want to get into, in this occasion, um, using effort on making distinctions where we can actually have to just get on and do things. That is a two-way street. The other part of that is the UK government has to recognise that we need to do things, again, no hierarchy of governments, we need to do things uh, in our way with our, the people we work for. And so far, I think that is recognised. That will need to continue to be recognised. Thank you, Kadrina. Thank you very much, Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, uh, convener, and good morning, Mr. I hope you get better soon. Um, can we uh, just uh, look at uh, something that this committee has spent a lot of time on, uh, and that's the, uh, the status quo around the withdrawal agreement? Um, is it my understanding, and this is a genuine question to you, Mr. Russell, that you have less of a problem with the withdrawal agreement because the, what the withdrawal agreement seems to do, or we were told the withdrawal agreement does, is in effect set out the parameters for exit of the EU uh, in the sense of guaranteeing EU citizens' rights, um, uh, offering short-term transition, and I appreciate it is short-term transition, uh, of continuity of the status quo for business um, and protects peace on the island of Ireland, but you're less happy with the terms around the political declaration. I is there any possibility that you foresee a circumstance where if the direction of travel changed in the political declaration, you could support the basic terms of the withdrawal agreement itself, which would allow us to move into this transitional period and thus avoid any sort of cliff edge that people talk about. It's an interesting question. I mean, I'll treat it seriously. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think it's fair to say there are, of course, things in the withdrawal agreement that would have to be in a legal text of 500 and something pages, with which we didn't take any uh, great exception, and some things we thought were useful. Um, but I think the fact that uh, you know, the four freedoms are not going to continue and the migration issues are a particular worry to us. They just do not work for Scotland. And there are a range of other areas. Given that there cannot be a, a renegotiation of the withdrawal agreement given the red lines, then I think we could not support the withdrawal agreement as it is drafted. There would have to be changes to the withdrawal agreement to make it acceptable to us. But I think you raise, uh, let me widen that point out, because I think you raise a, a particularly interesting point. Is there a way we could go from here to some different state where we were having a serious conversation about what happens and avoiding the cliff edge? And there is that way. But I don't think that can be done by taking the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration and trying to get it 
voted on and saying, that's what we have, now let's renegotiate it or change it. That was a Michael Gove position. I think what you need to do is to say, this does not work. We need something different, and that is the product of the red lines. I think that's, and you can get, you could only get that if you invoke the suspension of Article 50. Okay. Um, I, I guess what I'm, you know, what I'm keen to do, it'd be very easy for me to sit here and just say, look, there's a deal on the table, why won't you back it? I mean, it'd be a pointless question because I think I'd know the answer to that. So, uh, what I'm trying to tease out of you, uh, given your involvement in this whole process, is you know, some practical steps of where you think we could actually take this next. Uh, to take perhaps some of the, the, the politics out of it. I, I think if, if you accept that the, the withdrawal agreement as it stands has very little room uh, for manoeuvre in terms of change, um, and this committee and others have been told quite explicitly by the EU27 that that very much is what's on offer, um, the, uh, and any extension to Article 50 would be very short term, we were also told as well, uh, what do you think would be a practical way forward through all of this? Because there is a, I think there is a real risk that we could leave on the 20th of March with no deal. I don't think there's a huge appetite for that, but on a technical level, I think it possibly could happen. And if everyone is so keen to avoid that, knowing what we know, how could it be avoided? Well, I think the route is very clear. Um, I'm concerned what you say about leaving without a deal. Um, I like Mr Stewart, I, I, I hope against it and I hope we can get some progress. But I think the progress we need to see is this. First of all, the Prime Minister accepts that she needs to have at the very least an extension of Article 50 and therefore she asks for that. Secondly, that there is either an election or a referendum and I think the referendum is more likely to pass the House of Commons than a, 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 an election, but you know, I don't want to second guess it, but that's my expectation and that the referendum process is completed within the period of the suspension, which can only be six months um, at the present moment, uh, which would really mean if this was to be done in January, that it would have to be done in June. Now, that does fit in with the timetable for the European elections, just. So I would have thought that that's what needs to be done. That is the point that the First Minister put to the Prime Minister. It's the position we find ourselves in now, and it reflects the reality of the situation. Um, are there other options? I mean, I know that, for example, your colleague Donald Cameron has indicated his support for the Norway Plus model. Uh, I think that's helpful. I don't reject the Norway Plus model. But I think at the present moment, it's not a short-term solution. You know, it would require a considerable period of time. If the Norway Plus model were to be followed, then it would require, I think, the Prime Minister to revoke Article 50 and to say to the EU, we want to move forward on the basis of Norway Plus, which would be uh, an EEA EFTA type of arrangement. Whether that is as a member of EFTA, and of course the Norwegians have indicated, perhaps with some under understandably some nervousness about having the UK within that tent, uh, whether it is a special third pillar of EFTA, which is something that has been discussed, uh, that needs would take considerable time. I think given the seriousness of the present situation and the considerable costs and worry involved, the best way to do this is to seek a extension of Article 50 and to have a referendum. That's my view. Okay, and, and my, maybe perhaps my final question on this chain is, you previously had <coughs> expressed the Scottish Government's official position on this, and our, my understanding is that your official position was first not to leave the EU at all, and if you if we were going to leave the EU to remain a uh, member of the single market in the customs union, uh, at no point was the option of the referendum mentioned. In your opening statement, you said that your first preference is for a referendum. So therefore, can I just confirm that that is your official position that has changed from previously expressed? Uh, if there is to be another referendum, what should the question be? OK, I mean, I, I'm, I'm tempted and... and, and I'm sure members are aware of my fondness for a quote, uh, to quote Keynes in these circumstances, when facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? You know, the reality is the facts of this matter have changed. In recent weeks, we now have something on the table. Uh, our preference all along has been not to get to the stage where you have an appallingly bad deal or no deal as a choice. That was the Prime Minister's doing, not ours. Uh, in the circumstances of today, faced with what we are faced with, we believe the right next move is the revocation or suspension of Article 50 in a referendum. That is where we are 
today. Um, and in those circumstances, that's what we're arguing for. Um, I have, I have taken. Well, let me just finish. I've taken the issue of you know, after EA, the the issue of single market and customs union through endless discussions with the UK government. Uh, that was a compromise that was put on the table by us in December 2016. If only the Prime Minister had taken it, we wouldn't be in this mess. Sure, you haven't answered my question, though. What, what, what's the referendum? What's the, what are we asking? Uh, oh, sorry, the question of the referendum has to include Remain. Uh, you know, I think, therefore, we would have a discussion of what Remain is set against, given that the only thing that exists to set against it is the Prime Minister's deal. I suppose the likely outcome of, of, of that discussion in the House of Commons about the question would be the Prime Minister's deal or remain. But you, it's inconceivable you could have a, a, a referendum without remain as uh, an option. So a rerun of the last referendum? Well, no, it wouldn't be a rerun because there was no specified option in, in the last time. The, last, the option, the last time, if you remember correctly, was uh, very nebulous, if I may use that term again. Indeed, I have somewhere, I'm happy to share it with you, a leaflet about the issued by the Leave campaign about all the powers that this parliament would gain if people were to, to vote to leave. Uh, uh, no, that was the, the campaign that was run uh, very strongly in Scotland, and we've gained none of them. So you know, I think it was run on a false prospectus. What I'm saying is you have to have Remain, and you would, I think, probably have to have the fruits of the Prime Minister's work over two and a half years, such as they are. Okay, thanks very much. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Cabinet Secretary, obviously you were at the GMC meeting yesterday. Uh, did anything positive come from that? Well, we, we, I seem to remember wishing each other a happy Christmas. Um, I'm not sure I can think of anything else that positive that came out of it. The, the meeting discussed, I think the communique was, was clear. Um, the, the meeting discussed the withdrawal agreement and the current state of, uh, of play. It discussed the no deal scenario. Inter alia, it discussed the, the migration white paper, which of course had been issued without essentially uh, any real indication of when it was going to come out. It's rather it's interesting to note that uh, last Christmas, at the last JMC before Christmas, Brandon Lewis, who was then the migration, immigration minister, who's now the chair of the Conservative Party, I pressed him on when the white paper was coming out, and he would not say, uh, but he did, said it could come out before Christmas. He meant last Christmas. So this has been going on forever. Um, and a, that was, we had no indication, I think we knew late on uh, Tuesday evening that it was going to come out on Wednesday. So that was within the discussion. Um, and we also discussed the intergovernmental review, such as it is. So that was a discussion. I mean, you know, points were made on both sides of the table. Um, I, I will actually be fair about one thing. I raised significant difficulties in, in a couple of areas in terms of liaison on no deal. And uh, there was a, a very quick resolution involving uh, ministers and officials because they recognised how important that was to resolve it. So I, I, I do think on, on a work-a-day level of no deal, uh, you know, there was something positive. But in terms of the mega picture, no. OK, uh, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the immigration white paper uh, and discussion yesterday. Um, and in your opening statement, uh, you, you mentioned that the, the immigration white paper uh, would, uh, would not be positive uh, for Scotland. Can you elaborate on that, please? I hope I put it more, more strongly than that. I mean, to say it would not be positive you know, for Scotland is the equivalent of that famous line, that, you know, how did you enjoy the play, Mrs Lincoln? This is, this is an appalling set of circumstances. Eight, the paper says 85% uh, reduction is an estimate of EEA nationals. 85%. Um, I'll provide the calculations to you. I think we've published them in terms of the effect of GDP of a 50% drop, which is catastrophic. But 85% would be impossible to imagine. Uh, you know, it would throw the economy into complete chaos. Now, uh, you know, uh, there's a number of levels in which you want to take the migration white paper. It's a very practical workaday level of the economy which is this, this is impossible. And, you know, uh, it's not just us that say it. The Prime Minister keeps saying, listen to business, listen to industry. You know, uh, if you look, for example, at the uh, Tracy Black, the director of CBI Scotland, right, uh, which says it, 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 the government tunes out from the economic damage of draconian blocks on access to vital overseas workers. That's the CBI. Uh, Scottish Tourism Alliance, potentially devastating effects. The National Farmers Union, right, 
which says that the, 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 the evidence of our sectors had not been heeded. The policy chairman of the Federation of Scottish Businesses, these proposals will make it nigh impossible for the vast majority of Scottish firms to access any non-UK labour and skills they need to grow and sustain their operations. The institution of directors. It's fundamentally, it seems that the government's immigration policy is being driven by the unattainable, distracting and economically illogical net migration target. Right? University of Scotland. You know, and I declare an interest. You know, I have an interest in the university sector. This is University of Scotland, and it needs to be remembered. We want to be part of a society that is open, richer, culturally and financially. We need to be serious about attracting talent to our nation. It is hard to see how this can be achieved with today's white paper. I've never seen such a unanimity of condemnation. So on the, on the basic economics, but it goes further than that. It, this is wrong morally. This is a country that should be open and inviting and welcoming. Uh, it, you know, this is a country enriched by migration, both financially enriched by migration and culturally enriched by migration. You know, and many of us take this as a personal affront to how the world will see us, because we are not like this. We're not involved in dog whistle politics. We hate and reject that type of approach. So I think it should make those of us who read the paper actually angry about what we've witnessed and determined not to have it happen. And on the back of your comments there uh, and uh, the discussions that you'll be having um, in Scotland with uh, particularly with these uh, organisations but also others, uh, I would assume therefore uh, that, uh, that you would encourage as many people and organisations as, as possible to make further representations to the UK government to, to get their points, uh, hopefully try to get their points over uh, to the UK government to, so that they, they can change the white paper in the future? I, I would absolutely encourage them to do so. I don't think they'll need much encouragement because you know, their economic well-being is on the line. Uh, but I'm absolutely certain they will do so, and, and we will do so. Uh, and, of course, we're doing so with an alternative in mind. I mean, you know, clearly independence is the best alternative. But we have long argued for a devol devolved approach to migration. I mean, I remember having conversations about it with David Davis when he was in office uh, and pointing out to him the great advantage of devolving migration uh, because, in actual fact, you could then set whatever targets you wanted in the rest of the UK, but we could actually meet the needs that we have by ensuring that we had the best approach to it. It is an approach that exists in the Canadian provinces. It's the approach that exists in parts of Australia. It is not difficult to manage. Um, I think in all those circumstances, its time has come. And I think these bodies uh, you know, are moving towards it. It was interesting, actually, this year at the CBI annual dinner, the objection to it was not the objection in principle. The objection to, to it was the timing of it. And that is before they saw this appalling white paper. So you know, that is a short-term solution prior to independence of just putting in place a, a, a devolved system of migration. And that would be extremely uh, uh, po uh, positive. Um, I, I'm quoting the chief executive of the Scottish Tourism Alliance here. It says, I know there's a proposal from the Scottish government to look at a vis visa specific to Scotland to allow people to come and work in Scotland under the threshold of the 30,000 salary plan, and hopefully that would enable us to attract people and they would stay with us. You know, that, that's really important. Um, you know, I know from tourism business in my own constituency, they've been operating 10 to 15 percent below target on staffing already this year. That, this, this policy will make that much, much worse. Uh, we certainly heard from uh, Professor Manning uh, of the uh, MAC yes. um, in, in early November, uh, and uh, it was clear that uh, there had been no analysis uh, of Scotland's economy. Uh, and no analysis of uh, any of the recommendations that Mac were going to put forward as to how detrimental they would actually be for Scotland. Uh, and it's been, I mean, I mean, has been a constant disappointment. Uh, you know, I mean, it is a very narrowly focused group uh, without uh, adequate knowledge or information on the Scottish economy and Scottish demography. I, I would commend our evidence to Mac, which was very uh, professionally and, and scrupulously prepared. Um, and, and I do think that just tells you what the situation is. As you will know, we have now set up our own expert, an independent expert policy group, which will start reporting in the new year, uh, and which contains people who understand and have academic knowledge of the Scottish economy and Scottish democracy, and that's really important. Uh, and one final question, if I may, just it's on, uh, yeah, it's on IGR. 
Uh, you mentioned the IGR a few moments ago uh, and the review. Uh, will that review still continue uh, as the negotiations um, regarding the, the any transition period and the post-Brexit situation uh, take place? Yes, I mean, the IGR essentially responds to a, a point uh, that we have made, and I think Carwin Jones put it well, when saying that uh, devolution couldn't wear, bear the weight of Brexit, and that's where we found ourselves. So how does it change? Now, you know, I want it to change for Scotland to be independent. I think that's a far better answer. But it, whilst devolution continues, how does it develop and change? The Welsh published interesting information on that in August 2017. We addressed some issues in that in our first Scotland's Place in Europe paper in, in December 2016. There's material on the table. Uh, that's the generality of it. There's a specific of it, which is that... Um, the Seoul Convention is not operating at this present time uh, because it has been broken by the UK government. So we need to get an urgency on that, otherwise we will not approve uh, a Brexit legislation um, and not give legislative consent to it. I, ra I have raised this regularly. I've made proposals to the UK government about how we should take this forward. Uh, I stressed again yesterday the urgency of this, as did the Welsh. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we now want to move to Patrick Harvey. Before you ask your question, Patrick, can I welcome you to the committee and can I also ask you to declare any relevant interests? Thank you, convener. Very happy to be here as a substitute for Ross Greer. Uh, I don't believe I have any uh, registered interests that I'm formally required to, to declare, but I would like to put on the record, uh, just for, for clarity, uh, that I'm a member or supporter of several organisations that have uh, expressed views relevant to today's committee business. Uh, notably the European the European Movement of Scotland, uh, as well as the Equality Network and Stonewall Scotland. OK, thank you very much. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to ask about some of the uh, environmental aspects of this process, in particular European environmental principles and governance. We've, we've discussed some of this in, in the Chamber already uh, in relation to the, the continuity legislation, uh, the, the requirement for both governments to establish a set of environmental principles. And it, it may be too soon to, to be able to say exactly what the Scottish Government will do in response to the, uh, the Supreme Court ruling on that. But as a former Environment Minister, you'll also be aware of the importance of environmental governance. Uh, and in a period of change, if Brexit does go ahead, uh, there's a, a, probably a reasonable expectation that there might be a number of challenges or contested issues where governance bodies become very important. So I've got a twofold question, really. If somehow the withdrawal agreement is approved by the Westminster Parliament and is put into practice, uh, is the Scottish Government any further forward in deciding what will be the environmental governance structures that kick in or which we transition to during the, the transitional period in respect of what are devolved responsibilities in environmental matters? And the, the flip side of this is if there's a no deal uh, situation. If, if we if we are marched off the cliff uh, when the when the, the the withdrawal agreement is voted down, what on earth <coughs> is the reality in terms of the uh, the decision making authority in environmental governance matters, uh, which are currently handled at EU level, uh, and which would potentially fall into a, a a vacuum either at UK or Scottish level? Okay. Uh Neither are easy to answer at this stage, as, as, as Patrick Harvey will know, but I'll, I'll give a stab at both of them. Um, we have not, as Patrick Harvey knows, come to a conclusion yet about what we do next under the, with the continuity bill. Uh, you were a part of the discussion two nights ago. Uh, I will see Mr Scott, uh, I don't think that's a secret, later today uh, to see, seek his input to these matters. And in the new year, we will we'll take this forward. There are a number of options that exist. Um, the environmental issues... Uh, are some of the issues that have survived the, uh, I was going to say deceitful, but I won't use that word, the, 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 the approach that was taken to the bill uh, in the House of Lords. Um, so there is, with, with a small exception, which is important, but with a small exception. So we, we have something in there still which we could work on, but there are a number of ways of taking it forward. Um, I understand my colleague 
Ms. Anna Cunningham will consult on environmental governance in the new year, so I don't want to gainsay her position, but we, are, we do recognise that there will need to be uh, robust and, and effective environmental governance procedures in place. Um, I know there was an announcement yesterday from the UK government. I'm sorry I'm not across it. There were rather a lot of things happening yesterday. I'll, I'll get uh, up to speed on that uh, in a few days' time. But we will not allow the issues of environmental governance to be eroded or undermined uh, in this process and will work very hard and there are ways to do so. However, if we come to a no deal, I presently do not know what we will be able to do. A, the legislation, the environmental legislation, the, the secondary legislation that we're putting in place will transfer responsibilities, um, but I'm not sure it will do so as in an effective way which we could totally rely on. So I would want to think about that more carefully. Uh, I welcome the opportunity, if you would like to take it, for you to make representations to myself and to Rosanna on that once we see what the situation is in the new year. Because I think we could do with a conversation about the cliff edge uh, at that stage. And I'm happy to have that conversation. That's, that's appreciated. Uh, and you know, if in early January, or mid-January, the, the withdrawal agreement is rejected by, by Westminster, uh, then obviously, uh, notwithstanding the fact that many of us will, will want to cancel Brexit overall, there will also need to be an acceleration of, of no-deal preparations just in case. Uh, in, in your no-deal preparations so far, environmental services may have featured, for example, uh, the collection of recyclates, a lot of which uh, go quickly out of the country. There is very little storage capacity or, or, or management capacity if that was to build up. Uh, are you able to say anything about the, the planning that's taken place on, on those issues well, to date? We're cited on it. It is in the risks and issues uh, register. Uh, we know that this will be a concern. That essentially, the system will become blocked very quickly. Um, and uh, what we do with material in those circumstances has to be uh, considered. It will have to be stored. But it, as you know, there are issues, environmental and other issues, in terms of storage of it. So it's there. Uh, it will have to be addressed. It's being addressed alongside the other issues, whether it is best to store that at port. Uh, and wait for its, uh, uh, the opening of the circumstances which could happen, whether there are ways in which it can be processed, which is highly doubtful in, this, in Scotland, but are there ways in which that could happen, those are under consideration. Thank you. Uh, there, are, there are, of course, you know, a, a series of issues that arise also in terms of environmental uh, regulation, uh, which are the responsibility of Scottish government agencies, mm. Marine Scotland, uh, SNH, SEPA. Uh, they will all have to continue in operation at a time of no deal and at a time of, of pressure on resources and uh, you know some insecurity within communities and we're conscious of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kenneth Gibson. Yes, thank you very much. Can you good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we had some really interesting discussions in our visit to Brussels. One of them was with uh, Labour MEP uh, David Martin, who of course has been there since 1984. And one of the things he he said which, which um, resonated with me was about um, uh, Post-Brexit, uh, assuming we're still heading in that direction, Scotland's relationship with Europe and how we interacted in a business uh, um, sense uh, in particular. And he, he talked about, um, as you have mentioned already, about the Scottish Government perhaps strengthening its support and uh, networks in Paris and Berlin. But he said that if you think about it, Scotland will actually be not will not be a member state. It will not be part of a member state. It will be a sub-state legislature. So therefore, while Ireland will have direct communication with the governments in France, Germany and other member states, we won't even be outside the door. We'll be outside the outside door. And therefore, he suggested that you know, we'll have we'll be fair, effectively just another lobbying group with minimal influence, which will obviously impact on our trade and economy. And he suggested that the Scottish government might want to um, redirect its efforts towards places like, uh, you know, that are not capitals like Munich or Barcelona, Milan, perhaps, where we might actually get a hearing from the local regional governments, given the fact that uh, we will be so far out of the loop. I mean, this is quite a depressing scenario, but I'm wondering if you think that that's a, a a potential rational way forward once we're through the, the kind of Brexit mess that we're facing at this time? Well, I, I can see where David is coming from on that. <coughs> My own view is that Scotland's aspiration will be to rejoin as a member state at the first and earliest 
opportunity. Uh, and therefore, continuing a relationship with the capitals will be essential in those circumstances in order to keep the dialogue going and also to, to make sure that we are measuring up to the standards of the Aki. So I, I don't think we will be, as a government, um, um, downgrading our, our contacts or our aspirations. I tend to say to organisations uh, who talk to me about what they should be doing now, rather than weakening their connections uh, in Europe, they should be strengthening them at this stage. They should be putting in place stronger and more robust relationships which can uh, try and survive the shock of Brexit so that at the other end uh, they can build from, from where they are. So that will be my view and that's what we will certainly be trying to do. I can understand where David is. <coughs> we have had and continue to have good relationships you know, with, with a whole range of, of sub-state entities. But you know, we see ourselves, rightly see ourselves as a nation and we wish to be a nation within Europe. Well, obviously, you know, I agree with that, but it's whether or not we actually will get a hearing given what we're likely to face. But just to move on to something else, you talked about a general elections being pot potentially a way forward. Now, given the kind of incoherent uh, policy of deliberate ambiguity of the Labour Party, who, as I understand it, although I, I'm not 100% sure, appears to still be pro-Brexit, um, uh, what would that achieve? And also, can you comment on some of what we heard over in Brussels, which was that the capitals in Paris and Berlin fear that a common government would be more economically damaging than Brexit? Well, you know, I, I, I tend to be of the view that if we're trying to encourage people to uh, move along with us, uh, we, should, we should not necessarily condemn the slowest ships in the convoy. We should perhaps help them to get faster. Uh, so I'm going to try and do that. Uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, well, 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 let's then seek them out and get them into the convoy. I mean, I'm disappointed about where we are. I'd like to have seen a motion of no confidence this week. I think it would have been important to do so. It doesn't look presently as if that's going to happen. Um, I, I do think that uh, allowing the Prime Minister to play this to a position in which she can present it as being her deal or no deal is the wrong, absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, you know, uh, so I want to try and get everybody doing the same thing. That's been my strategy <laughs> in this parliament. Uh, it continues to be my strategy. Um, I, I would continue to uh, uh, ask the Labour Party, whatever my opinion is of, of the individuals, I would continue to ask the Labour Party to consider that at this absolutely historic juncture, uh, and you know, historic is a much uh, ill-used word, but at this historic juncture, uh, they should be active like never before in holding the UK government to account and endeavouring to change it. OK, lastly, that's very diplomatic of you, given the symbolic position that they put forward. But lastly, on the, on the, the, the possibility of a further referendum, you might have seen Liam Fox on the, the Mars show on Sunday saying, well, if there's a second referendum, we're going to go for best of threes, people in his kind of wing of the Conservative Party. I mean, you know, it's, it's un beyond belief, but that, that's what he's saying. Um, so do you believe that this is anything, would be anything other than kicking the can further down the road and what will achieve in the short to medium term? Well, it one, gives people the Sorry, one last thing I would just sorry. say is that Tavi Scott said that Amber Rudd supported a, a second referendum. She was on BBC this morning saying that she personally did not support that. <coughs> Well, I, mean, yeah, I, I, I think if you're in the UK <coughs> cabinet, you say what you think. You know, somebody comes around and says to you, "You better not be thinking that." You know, and then they're sent out onto television and say they don't think it. It's ludicrous those circumstances. Uh, when you when you're in those circumstances, I, I have to say, you know, uh, uh, Attlee's remark springs to mind in terms of Liam Fox. I think a period of silence would be in order. You know, he is one of the people who has created this extraordinary mess. And what he has to contribute to getting out of it is zilch, nada, nothing at all. So when I don't watch him on these shows, because he's part of the problem, not part of the solution, what we should be doing is working with people, and I believe, to go back to the point, cross-party, and with elements in the Conservative Party too, we should be working to resolve what is an unprecedented national emergency and trying to get ourselves into the right position. And I believe at the present moment, and Mr Green's question is germane to this, at this particular moment, the right approach to do is to make sure we defeat the Prime Minister's deal, reject the no deal, and the means are to hand to do that, the means are absolute to hand to do that, and then have a second referendum. The issue, of course, for the Prime Minister is that she's being held to ransom by 
people like that, though. I mean, I mean, I know you say he doesn't have anything to contribute, but he he probably is resonant of many views within conservative constituencies up and down the country. I mean, I don't have any truck with his views at all, but that's a re an issue we, that, that, that that's why we're in this position because the whole re the situation was created, as you know, by a civil war within the Conservative Party and, and uh, David Cameron's kind of um, badly judged way of resolving it. Well, Mr Scott's point was was the you know, right one. I mean, the choice is to whether she splits the Conservative Party or not. You know, she has the, the Robert Peel choice in front of her. Uh, does she split her own party in order to create um, essentially the right solution for, inverted commas, the nation? Uh, she has proved herself incapable of so doing. She is no Robert Peel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for coming to give evidence today? And can I wish you all a happy Christmas as well? Thank you very and, much. And uh, we shall now uh, suspend the meeting to allow for a changeover in witnesses. Okay. We now move on to the next item on our agenda, an evidence session on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. And this is our final evidence session on stage one of the bill. Uh, the committee has received a wide variety of views, both before and well after the formal conclusion of the call for views. And I've been happy to receive these uh, late submissions well after the formal, formal deadline. In fact, as late as I can allow. However, there does come a time where the committee has to finally take stock of all the evidence uh, that it has received. And the committee is very well aware of the wide range of views and strong feelings about the issues uh, raised in the bill. And we're very grateful 
to everyone who has shared their views at committee's stage one consideration of the bill. Um, I'd like to welcome our witnesses, Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. And Fiona is joined by four officials, uh, Amy Wilson, the Director of Statistical and Registration Services, Scott McEwen, Head of Collections and Operations, Scotland Census 2021 at National Records of Scotland, Simon Stockwell, the Head of the Family Law Unit, and Emma Lutton, the, a law, uh, lawyer for the Scottish Government. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to be here to be able to talk about the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. Uh, but before s speaking specifically about the Bill, I'd like to uh, take a moment to speak more generally about the Census. Uh, the next Scotland Census will t be taken on Sunday, the 21st of March 2021, subject to the approval of Parliament. Uh, this will be the 22nd Census to take Take place and the 17th to be managed independently here in Scotland. For the first time in 2021, it will be predominantly online. Um, our country has relied on the census for over 200 years to underpin national and local decision making. The census is the only survey of its kind to ask everyone in Scotland the same questions at the same time, <coughs> and no other survey provides the richness and the range of information that the census does. There are some basic principles uh, underlying the census. The main point of the census is that it counts uh, for collective decision making. It has to be credible. Uh, people have to have confidence in it and it needs to be consistent uh, for comparisons. Uh, there must be confidence in the uh, census process from all our citizens to ensure they provide us with their personal information. Uh, this confidence is twofold. Uh, first, in trusting uh, that we will ensure that the data is kept safely and securely, but secondly, in trusting that we ask the most appropriate questions that reflect our society at that time and that we do this sensitively. Uh, delivering on this trust is why we have over 200 years of data and can proudly demonstrate a consistency of approach over these years. Some questions have come and gone, but we have always been consistent in our professional approach to the census and with the tracking of the core data. So I'm here today to specifically have a discussion about the census bill. Um, as you know, the purpose of the bill is to amend the 1920 Census Act to allow questions on sexual orientation and prescribed aspects of gender identity, those being on transgender status and history, to be asked on a voluntary basis. The power to ask these questions on a mandatory compulsory basis already exists in the Census Act, but refusing to answer a census question or neglecting to do so is an offence uh, under the Section 8 of the Census Act 1920, and we want to avoid that for individuals answering these new questions. The approach of the Bill seeks to mitigate concerns about intrusion into private life by placing these questions on a voluntary basis, as was done with religion when it was first included uh, for the first time in the 2001 census. It is important that nobody is or feels in any way compelled to answer these important but sensitive questions. The need for collecting this information has been arrived at through a process of consultation and research. National Records of Scotland has worked and continues to work with stakeholders to understand the needs and concerns of the communities involved. However, NRS recognised that more consultation is required as the actual questions themselves are developed, such as with women's groups, as the NRS has communicated with you. That is now underway as part of the further stakeholder work required in order to ensure that all users' data needs can be uh, understood and considered. It's widely recognised that there is limited evidence on the experiences of trans, uh, transgender people in Scotland with currently no fully tested question with which to collect information. Therefore, the census would be taking a big step forward to ensure that we can develop the evidence needed to provide support and protection for Scotland's transgender population. Sexual orientation is already asked in most Scottish household surveys and it is proposed that the sexual orientation question for the 2021 census would mirror the question already used in these other surveys in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. Society has changed significantly and rapidly in the 10 years since the last census, so we must ensure the census in 2021 reflects that. And we recognise that despite the purpose of the bill being about the voluntary nature of these two questions, many stakeholders will be focused on whether or not these questions should be asked and how they relate to other possible questions. 
The bill is not about the mandatory sex question, but we are aware that there are strong and often very opposed views on whether a question on sex should be binary, non-binary, relate to birth certificates, legal sex, or be more, fo more focused on self-identification. So whilst this bill does not specifically relate to the, these issues, there are clearly matters that are concerning stakeholders. The bill currently uses the term gender identity to cover transgender status and history to enable an element of future proofing in relation to the legal definition of transgender. It also assists in ensuring that the questions about sex and transgender can be clearly separated so the question on sex would continue to be asked on a mandatory basis. <clears throat> However, I recognise that this has raised concerns that the bill conflates uh, gender identity and sex. And I want to be very clear, the intention behind the Census Bill has never been to conflate sex and gender identity. It is about asking questions to obtain information. It is not about the law on gender recognition or on equalities. And I'm aware that NRS has written to the convener to indicate a willingness to consider how these matters might be perceived in relation to the census and importantly, to understand the views of the committee. In terms of what actual census questions will be asked, uh, there, is th there is still a work in progress. Uh, the bill is in front of you is not about agreeing whether these questions will be asked or indeed the wording of the question. The questions uh, set will be considered as part of the subordinate legislation proce process, which will happen next year. And I want to assure you that the views and evidence which have been submitted around these issues will feed into the further consideration for the questions to be asked on sex in 2021. On the questions to be set and the wording of the questions, um, generally, we expect a period of informal engagement with the committee to begin after the stage three of the bill and continue throughout 2019. This informal engagement process, as, re as recommended by the Parliament's committee the last time, uh, in 2011, is intended to improve on the 2011 census process by ensuring that the committee will be given the opportunity to properly scrutinise the questions for the census in 2021 before the formal consideration of the subordinate legislation. And it's intended that the formal census order and regulations will be taken to the Parliament in early 2020. However, we would like to agree the legislative timetable with you, including what you would find helpful um, to give uh, in the thorough consideration that will be required. Before ending, I'd like to draw the committee's attention to a couple of drafting points in relation to the policy memorandum. The first being in relation um, to it incorrectly, including intersex people under the umbrella term trans. This was an unfortunate action during drafting in an area that is constantly developing. We recognise that the needs of trans people and intersex people are different. Going forward, we'll ensure that any documentation does not include intersex people within the trans umbrella. The second point being in relation to it saying that the 2021 sex question will have a non-binary response, it should have said that this is the approach currently being considered and tested. Uh, this is a matter that will be brought to the committee as part of the subordinate legislative process. So I wish the committee to note these two <coughs> points. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you today about the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for that statement, which does clarify a, a number of matters. Um, and can I particularly welcome um, <coughs> your assertion that the evidence gathered by the Committee on these matters will form part of NRS's consultation going forward? Because um, I think a number of people uh, have come, come forward for the first time to express their concerns about some of these matters. Um, can I um, start by... Uh, Acknowledging the point that you make, the general principles of the bill about asking uh, these questions and uh, gender identity and sexual orientation on a voluntary basis. And I think it's fair to say that in terms of all the evidence that we've gathered, that's not uh, con controversial in, in any way. Um, however, in terms of the drafting of the bill, um, you will be aware that although you say that um, the bill is not about uh, the sex question, uh, the drafting of the bill does um, does suggest that after sex in uh, section one of the bill, um, there should we should insert the words including gender identity. Now, NRS have written to the committee suggesting that they would be open um, to look again at the drafting of the bill. And actually, since they gave their evidence, the Equality Network has written uh, to the committee with some very specific uh, suggestions in terms of how the bill could 
perhaps be redrafted. Um, and what they suggest is that um, they, they would change uh, gender identity, uh, to, which is, they say is perhaps not the most appropriate term, uh, to trans status, and that uh, trans status would be included um, in the uh, section 1-2-B of the bill, um, besides sexual orientation. And the issue of gender identity would be removed from section 1-2-A of the bill. I mean, that strikes me, that suggestion strikes me as quite a constructive one that actually would probably be welcomed by a number of opposing groups. And I just wondered what, what your view uh, was of that suggestion. Uh, well, clearly we want to hear what the committee's view is, having taken um, the different uh, uh, elements of evidence from, from uh, different uh, contributions. Uh, clearly, in terms of the drafting of the bill, which was drafted actually some time ago, and obviously a lot of these issues are, are coming more evident just now in terms of uh, terms we use and what we mean. The purpose of the bill is for voluntary questions on transgender status and, I would say, history. So we need to think about how we would make sure that it was captured both the status and, hi and history um, in terms of the questions that are currently being, being looked at. Uh, the gender identity aspect was to be uh, a, a an umbrella term that would allow a bit more flexibility. However, I very much appreciate the comments that have been made and the contributions that have been made, and that actually might help um, differentiate between sex and gender identity, which is also an issue for some women, as well as for equality groups, recognising that the purpose of the bill is actually to capture transgender status and history. So that's something that we can certainly uh, consider, and obviously we'll look at what the committee suggests itself, and we would respond to that. I think in terms of your point about the words, I, I suspect it's not even the issue around using the words gender identity. I think it's the, the word that uses, uses the term including, because it, it, it's, it, that's the bit that can or can be perceived to conflate sex and gender identity. So I think that's a very serious point that we would certainly uh, look at and uh, very much appreciate the committee's attention to that and for people bringing that to our attention as well. Okay. Right. OK, thanks very much for that. Now, uh, assuming that we did pr proceed on that basis, um, as the Equality Network say, and as you said yourself, um, the, the questions of how the questions are going to be asked is for the future, but this committee will have a role uh, in that. Um, you'll be aware that uh, the Office of National Statistics um, has actually made its views clear on Friday that it doesn't think that the question uh, of sex should be a self-identified one, and it doesn't think that there should be a third option on the question of sex. And it's a quality impact assessment that was published on Friday actually reflects a lot of the evidence that we've taken in this committee, particularly from uh, data users. Um, it says that uh, the, sec the question of sex, uh, male or female, is established in the census and it's essential to the evaluation of inequality related to that protected characteristic. And that consideration has been given to amending the question to reflect a wider range of options, given that there's a greater recognition than previously of individuals who reject traditional binary views. Nevertheless, the protected characteristic of sex as defined in the Equality Act and is relevant for the public sector equality duty is whether the person is a man or a woman. And this binary context co uh, concept of sex is in turn fundamental uh, to the definition of sexual orientation or of gender redesignment and the law of marriage and uh, and civil partnership and many other matters. So, so they basically, after a lot of consideration, um, believe that the sex question you know, should remain a binary question and it should not be about self-identification, which, as I say, reflects a lot of the evidence from data users that, that we have heard. Uh, and I wondered if, you know, how much you're going to take that into consideration going forward, because we've got very, you know, quite a difference of views there compared to the explanatory notes for your bill. Well, obviously, we'll look at what the UNS are doing and they're looking at what we're doing and they'll, they'll be considering the evidence that um, I'm sure they'll be interested in the experience that we've got in this parliament looking at this. I would reiterate, you're obviously straying into the areas of what will be the next stage, which is the, the dialogue in relation to the actual <coughs> questions for the next uh, uh, the next uh, stage of the bill, which would be looking at the actual questions. So but I, I, I'm, you know, acknowledge that that's obviously been an area that, despite it not being the subject of this bill, you've had quite a lot of evidence on. Um, the, the importance, I think, of the sex question is that 
you know, it's it's one, it's mandatory. Um, we've always had that question. Um, in 2011, it was the same. It was the same question as it's always been. But clearly, 10 years ago, people were asking. Some people, trans people in particular, were asking, "Well, how would I answer this?" And so, therefore, as you aware there was guidance produced for the 2011 Scottish census that said you know, um, you can fill this in on a, a self-identification basis um, I'm not sure it's absolutely clear what the ONS plan to do um, uh, unless my colleagues can tell tell me uh, more about the up-to-date position that they have from that um, but clearly a self-identified binary sex question is simple um, it's the same as it was in 2011. I think when you start to try and um, define sex, whether it's legal or biological, you start to complicate the actual question that is in front, front of you. I'm, I'm going back to my kind of basic principles that there's got to be simplicity around this, and that's part of the testing of the questions, which questions are more likely to have the best responses. And I think that's something at the next stage that um, I'm, I'm keen that the, the uh, NRS can share with you what their experience is in testing different questions to see what Again, the authorities what will give the best response. But uh, perhaps I, I could ask my colleague Amy if you've got any latest information as to what you think the ONS um, are likely to do in relation to the next stage and looking at the actual content of the mandatory sex question. My understanding from um, talking to colleagues at ONS is that they are proposing, as you say, a binary question in 2021, but their view is that that question will be consistent with 2011. So um, they haven't, as far as I'm aware, said publicly whether that is going to be a self-identification question or not, um, and that is something we'll be working with them further on. The, 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 the guidance that you, you produced in 2011 was online, and most people really didn't know about it. Um, did the ONS produce the same guidance uh, for 2011 in England and Wales? Yes, they did. And in fact, we um, went with the same guidance that they had produced. So the guidance that we provided was the same guidance that ONS had developed in 2011. Right. OK, thanks very much. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, because uh, Professor Susan McVeigh from the University of Edinburgh, who is the co-director of the Administra Administrative Data Research Centre in Scotland, and I believe she also sits on the board of National Statistics for Scotland. She said, I think that the General Register for Scotland got it wrong when it redesigned the census in 2011 and conflated sex and gender identity into one question. And we went on to have a discussion about how um, that could affect data going forward as more people uh, self-identify. We had some clinical e evidence of that. Um, and she talked about the importance of census data, uh, whereas while you might be talking about small numbers, in terms of intersectionality of data and getting down uh, to, to, to smaller numbers, it was very important. And she thinks was, this is an opportunity, given that we are now giving people the opportunity to express their gender identity. And another question, uh, to maintain the integrity of the sex question because of its importance in the Equality Act. To my principles, uh, there has to be consistency, which I think is important, and that's, a, that's why obviously there's an argument to be consistent with 2011, but it's also got to be credible and people have to have confidence in it. Um, I think the fact that we're asking a voluntary uh, transgender question would actually help in terms of the statistical basis, but I would say in terms of the credibility, the 2011 census was not wrong, um, and I think it actually in terms of having the voluntary transgender uh, question, that would help statistically in being able to extrapolate in relation to uh, what the projections might be in relation to the, the, the population issues on, on male and uh, female. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, we've heard uh, much evidence that is supportive of the questions being placed as voluntary, which is the purpose of this piece of legislation. Um, there have been suggestions that because they're voluntary, people might not answer them. There might not be enough data collected. Though, to be fair to the witnesses we've heard, most people didn't think that was a problem. Um, is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied with the status of the questions being voluntary? And the Cabinet Secretary did say there was limited evidence on transgender. Do you think taking this approach will provide greater evidence and improve policy making? Um, I think it will. And, and going back to that, um, that uh, point I made just earlier about the principle of this being importance of having credibility and confidence, it's also with the transgender community to make sure that they're confident in um, being able to fill this in, that that's something that uh, the questions are, are drafted in a way that would encourage the maximum amount of uh, completion. And so therefore, the stakeholder engagement that has taken place with the transgender and equality groups um, has informed you know, the types of questions that are likely to be asked. And again, the actual content of these questions 
questions, we'll, that's a, that'll be the next stage of the um, deliberations on the census, which we'll share with you. And again, it's about trying to make sure you maximise the uptake from that. But I think if you had it on a compulsory basis, there was a, a real concern that that would be an intrusion, intrusion into privacy of some transgender people. Um, and so therefore, the opportunity of having it as a voluntary question is something that I think would encourage, would respect transgender people, but also um, uh, and, uh, with, with the, the type of activity we would want around the census completion, encourage them to, to be able to fill in the forms. And can I ask about the use of the term gender identity, which the convener has uh, picked up on, and we have received further evidence suggesting you could change the wording of that. Um, the Cabinet Secretary and the Bill team have described that as a way to protect against um, well, it's a future proofing. Um, I, I was interested in where else you see that question developing. Why to refer to it as a trans question would be too limiting. And well, uh, there's, there's quite yeah. evidence that gender identity isn't a recognised term, or it's yeah. like, there's a lack of clarity over what actually comes under. What does it mean? Yeah. Well, that, that's why the specific um, aspects of what's being uh, we we expect to be asked. Again, we'll have to share the questions with you as to what the the, the actual text of the the voluntary questions will be. But it would be about not just transgender status, but also transgender history. Um, and so, therefore, uh, the the view is that if we had a, a broader umbrella term, um, uh, because. It's some, you know I think we are in, a, in a, I suppose a movable territory where people are uh, you know there isn't sort of a clear one definition on gender identity but also potentially on transgender identity so therefore um, that was the idea of having flexibility around that but if we are going to be specific there would be an opportunity to to specifically say the voluntary questions to allow and the reason you need voluntary you know to say it's voluntary is so that people don't get fined or, or be uh, subject to an offence and you don't we don't want that especially in a, a very personal and private area of sexual orientation and, and transgender. So that was the, the, the rationale for doing that, but also to separate out the, the questions of sex and, and gender identity. But if the bill, I think, doesn't um, you know, is perceived to conflate those issues, I think that doesn't help us. We need to have, as I said, clarity in what we're doing. So I'd rather things were quite straightforward and simple. Um, and so therefore, uh, you know, although the, the gender identity might be a, a useful um, catch-all umbrella, uh, uh, term, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily help if it's causing issues as to what should or should not be the voluntary questions, which are quite specific in what we're trying to get. OK, that, that's welcome. Um, the final question was maybe around the guidance that was published the last time and where, if the future guidance would head. When I had a look at the Public Bodies Gender Representation Act, that, we passed it recently, I'm, that, I think that was the title, of, on public boards. Um, the definition there is, is quite um, is quite prescriptive. So it's if you have a certificate or if you are living as a woman, if you are intending to go for the certificate, it's quite it's quite prescriptive. Um, the guidance, the last thing that accompanied was very self-identifying. Um, and, it, and it's where this then fits in with the Gender Recognition Act review that is concluded. In some ways it feels, I don't know whether, if we're ahead of ourselves in some areas, then if that, Makes sense. That's a, a really important point. It probably cuts to what a lot of this issue is about because society has changed uh, hugely in the last ten years, um, and it's already and, and it's and it's continuing to change. And society and that's part of what the census does is capture where the society is at any point in time. But when the guidance would have been given in 2011, it was way before, obviously, the legislation you've just talked about. And we don't even know necessarily what will happen in the, the gender recognition legislation that's yet to come. And of course, the you know we also had the Gender Recognition Act from the 2004. So it is a movable. I mean, this area has been um, you know society and indeed I think the policy around it ha has been progressively moving. Um, you might argue that the um, the 2011 guidance, which <coughs> said, was we've heard was both um, in the rest of the UK and Scotland was, was similar, uh, was probably quite progressive in talking about self-identification, but it was also about, um, it was to be, I think, inclusive. And I think that's the other point about um, how do you make sure you're including people to make sure that they can be you know, that they, they can have the opportunity to fill in the form in the way that they is true to them. And I think that's part of that balance. So, um, you know, you can't retrofit you know, looking at what the guidance was in 2011, which I wasn't involved in, I wasn't the minister at the time, um, with, you know, legislation that has either come subsequently or in, 
or, you know, is likely to come in terms of the, the programme for government in terms of the legislative programme coming forward in this place. So it's not easy. That's the, the point. But the census is a point in time. Um, it captures information as it will be in 2021. Um, but it also, I suppose, the, the, the point is the census has to reflect society as it is, not what it might be in the future. It's got to be captured at the point in March 2021. And I think that's, that's the, the point about how do we make sure it's fit for purpose for 2021. But even in the course of this deliberation and your, you know, your evidence sessions, you can see that there are obviously different issues that have emerged that maybe weren't as obvious in 2011. And certainly the self-identified gender issue was not perhaps as, as politically, um, I suppose, um, as controversial as it currently is just now. Um, and it just seemed to me an obvious way. I, I personally, and this is where you know, I would, I'll talk personally on this view, is I, I do think we need to be inclusive to, to make sure that people can contribute to the census as part of a citizen of this country to be part of that collective data. Um, but, you know, that's where, I suppose, as, a, as the government of the day and, and you as the parliamentarians of the day have to determine, you know, how do you reflect society as it is certainly in 2018, but also how it will be in 2021 uh, when the actual question is going to be asked. So it's not, it's not easy, but I'm trying to explain why there's differences between what happened in 2011, what happened in the legislation you've just talked about, and what might happen in the future. And I think that's the point about whether we're gender, if, if we're trying to future-proof, uh, there's a point in time where you maybe just have to draw a line and say, no, this is where, where Scotland is just now. I'm, I'm really pleased about how this country has progressed in different ways in terms of its inclusive agenda, but we also have to recognise that when the census is completed, it's for the millions, and we mean to make sure it's straightforward for the millions to fill in, but to make sure we can do so in as inclusive way as possible, but to get the data that we need. And I actually think the bill, in, in, in its approach, by making sure that the questions are very sensitive and personal in relation to sexual orientation and also in uh, transgender history and status, is the right way to do it by making sure they're, 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 they're voluntary. And I think that's the stage that we're at in, in, in terms of the census. You will be aware, of course, from the evidence that we've taken that there are a number of feminists that don't believe that self-identification is a progressive move, but that's perhaps for another but, discussion. Yeah. Um, can I bring in Tavish Scott? So it's supplementary to uh, Claire Baker's line of questioning there. Um, the objective, of course, is to produce data which is helpful for policymakers and service deliverers. I, I absolutely take your point. If definition is not clear, how do we trust the subsequent data that's collected? Well, um, we've never defined sex. Um, uh, in the 200 years that we've been doing the census. Um, isn't it? And, and, that, and, and actually, it's the simplicity of asking that question is, means that you know, people do fill it in, you've got that data. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's the point, is that sometimes the, you, you, we can't check. We mm. can't check if you filled that in mm. correctly or not. There isn't a way of us, no. you know, because, entirely take that. because we've got to respect the anonymity of individuals yeah. filling it in. Entirely, so, that's yeah. entirely fair. But do, do you, do you, are you concerned that on the other side, if the definitions are not... Uh, that you, just as you were describing to Claire Baker, the definitions are not precise, then policymakers will say, well, this data is very interesting, but how can we be assured it's accurate? Yeah. I suppose it's a question well, I'm But that's, that's why I think we've got to test the questions, yes. make okay. sure that they're robust. And I think the next stage that we'll, of the engagement with the committee is to share the evidence around what the successful yeah. completion rates are on the testing that has been done to date. And I think that will be helpful for the next stage of the census when you're looking at the actual questions itself, uh, because it has to be, remember, going back to credibility and confidence, Absolutely. not just for the individual, but as you said, for the data users themselves. And it's absolutely essential because to get the optimum um, completion of this, one, people have to know how important it is, and I think your, your point about how it helps service delivery and the communication campaigns, the advertising that will take place around it, people have to have confidence in, and it's got to be credible for individuals but also for users as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jamie, did you have a supplementary on that on point? The theme, yeah. Yeah, just okay. well, is, it, is it a supplementary because we don't have an awful lot of time? Right, okay. Well, with respect, that would right, okay. be good to ask a question yeah, if okay. I can. Um, I, I think one of the problems with this is that what seems to be quite a simple piece of legislation addressing a technical issue around your ability to add mandatory questions has opened up a huge Pandora's box as part of a much wider social discussion around gender recognition and identification, uh, which is fine, but we still have a job to do in, on this committee. And it is relevant to what's previously been said, and that's there still is an issue here that if the 2011 census, the sex question was in guidance, albeit not widely promoted guidance, was based on self-identification, and that question is mandatory and binary, 
And the future census will have voluntary questions around trans history or status or gender identity, whatever the terminology or questions may be, but those are voluntary. If people are answering the mandatory question through the status quo method of self-identification, what difference would that make to the voluntary questions that you may ask? In other words, there, there has been confusion over how you answer the mandatory question because there were no other options. But if there are other options, do you think that will alter the way that people answer the mandatory sex question? Right. I think, that, again, this is an absolutely critical point, which is probably for the next for the next section right. um, of, of the process, but you're cutting to the chase of what the issues are. This is about a social discussion, about the census is always social. It's actually, believe it or not, asking the religious question was controversial um, last time, as was the language question, as some of you might remember in 2001 as well. Uh, this bill, though, and actually the census itself is not about... Um, status of any individual in terms of giving it recognition so it's not about recognition and it's not about um identity per se it's actually about answering questions for information right. and so therefore your point about the interplay between the two questions is really really important and so therefore that's why and you know, my instinct is simplicity in the questions is helpful but also we understand from the voluntary questions asking the trans status and history that also allows to make sure that it's quite clear what we're asking because um, there might be a, somebody might have a history but then recognizes themselves currently as in transgender status as something different from where they were previously and that's what we need to capture but we also think the interplay between that question and the mandatory question we'll be able to identify in terms of numbers and they're not huge numbers we don't necessarily expect they'll be huge numbers we don't know because we haven't counted them um, but that's the point is to be able to make sure the statisticians can pull them about I don't know Amy if you want to add anything to that I think it's critical I would just say that I think you make very important points and that is why the testing and the work that we're doing that we've done today and that we're continuing to do I think is of prime importance because that is very much about understanding how people then interpret those questions whether having a new question either immediately following or in a different part of the form actually changes um, how somebody would answer that question and that would be the type of evidence that we would want to bring back to the committee yeah. as part of the consideration to make sure that we're very clear if there are changes how that might affect um, people's responses and the consistency of data going forward. And could I just ask a quick technical question on the process for the bill, why we're doing it through primary legislation to allow you to add extra questions on a mandatory basis and then using subordinate legislation to get into the nitty gritty. Is it just because you need more time in the consultation or is it easier to do it that way than to have done it all in the face of the bill? Well, that's the way it's always <laughs> that's the way it's always been done but okay. actually we're being very transparent by bringing a bill in primary legislation in this actually you know we could have not had a bill and just asked all these questions on a mandatory basis but I don't think for the reasons I've already stated that would have been right or fair so the whole purpose of this is just to make sure that there are no fines involved um, for people answering questions on sexual orientation and transgender so it's quite discreet but you know as your evidence I mean there's a great deal of in we've had 15,000 responses to, to the original consultation there's a great deal of interest in the census so we're starting to get into the area which is the next stage but clearly these are the critical and you know critical points so it's always come and that's why the, in 2011 one of the concerns of the committee the then committee that looked at the 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 sense the actual census questions because that's the that's the big substance of what it is so it's in supporting legislation it's a census order and um, that they said look rather than give us a fait accompli at the end of this we should then can then you know have concerns about it if the parliament the committee can work with the process they can inform it so it's so they can actually then influence um, what the questions might be if there are problems with the questions in terms of looking at the actual content. So that's what why we've got on what I hope is a new and improved um, process. It's probably front-loaded a lot of the issues compared to previous times, but we want to try and be as open and cooperative with the committee because we need you. We absolutely need you. And going back to um, Jamie's point, this is about society. And if you're here reflecting what society's views are as a committee, that your advice on this is going to be very, very, very important indeed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you. Convener, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, picking up on the on the issue that was raised earlier, just for clarity, so the intention of the bill, as has been said, is not about the mandatory, uh, any mandatory question, including the mandatory sex question. Uh, therefore, there's been some error in drafting where there's language that, that would refer to the mandatory question. So presumably that it's in a schedule. I don't have actually the draft the bill in front of me, but that would then be, the intention is that that would be deleted 
Uh, so, uh, uh, in the section, I'll probably now get the section wrong, section one, uh, two, section one, subsection two. So the intention, that's what my understanding is. So if this is, if this is not the intention of the bill, then the, 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 the presence of that language in this bill in front of us is incorrect because that's not what the bill is intended to do. And therefore, the intention would be either for the government to bring forward an amendment or to accept a relevant amendment to delete that brought forward by a member of this committee or, or otherwise? So the actual, obviously the, the, the actual um, wording of the, the bill itself can be amended at stage two and that's obviously we'll take the advice of the committee on that and, and, and consider that. Um, the wording in the bill does not affect the mandatory questions at all. Um, it just provides for the opportunity for gender identity to be asked. You could either have it, in my understanding, and I'll ask of my the, the legal um, support here to correct me if I'm wrong, you could either ask it um, in relation to the sex, um, the, the name sex, the, the, schedule, um, the schedule 5 and the, the census bill or the schedule on it um, talks about the, the different things that can be asked. You can either have it there or, so it's an either or, it's not, it's, but I think your interpretation that um, the language is not helpful for those that think this is conflating sex and gender identity and I think it's the word including that is the problem uh, but if it's clear to have it uh, another section that's something that we would we would consider. Okay so that would be something yeah. the government would be open to doing yeah. just really to clarify that. Going on to uh, kind of where we we are at the moment obviously we have received a, a lot of evidence um, obviously the very strong views <coughs> on a number of issues um, it seems from reading the evidence to me that the, 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 a, a view that is consistently clear uh, from many, many people who have given evidence, including before the committee, is that, um, turning to the issue of the mandatory question, that sex doesn't permit of a, a non-binary option. Uh, and so Professor McVie has been quoted by the convener already, looking at her evidence last week. Sex is about either biological or legal sex, whichever you decide to use, whereas gender identity has non-binary options. Sex does not have... Uh, uh, have non-binary options. So I just wonder, therefore, <clears throat> in terms of where the, the National Register of Scotland is now, uh, I understand that they're currently testing questions on non-binary options. I mean, how did the, what informed that approach? Because it seems to us that actually many, many people were not even consulted by the National Register of Scotland. They were never spoken to. People who have expertise as statisticians, data users, and uh, a number of women's organisations so forth, they weren't actually spoken to by National Rights of Scotland. So how have National Rights of Scotland got to the stage that they're testing a non-binary question? Who has informed that, that process thus far? And what will maybe now change going forward? I mean, I asked the question last week to the data users and statisticians. You know, if they were now contacted by National Register of Scotland, you know, would they be willing to, to work with National Register of Scotland? They, they said yes, they would be, but they have never been contacted about this matter. So I'll bring the NRS in, but I think there is a, a kind of point about making sure in terms of the actual content of the actual mandatory question that we involve the stakeholders that would have a, a view on that. And that obviously is the stage we're in just now. Um, and that would include a lot of the people that have given you evidence to this committee. Um, and I, I know NRS have communicated to the convener that that is now happening. But uh, Amy, do you want to... Answer that. So in terms of why, why we've um, been testing that question, the consultation on the topics which was asked was asking for people to come forward with their data, the, the needs that they had for 2021. And what came forward as part of that consultation was um, an expression that the question in a binary form may not be um, inclusive enough for um, some people to respond to. So we didn't have anybody who came forward as part of that consultation. There was, in fact, up until this point in time um, throughout this, the process with the bill, we haven't um, been made aware of concerns around that. We followed up on the, the needs which were expressed as part of the consultation, but I think it's absolutely right what you say that now we are being made aware. We've, we've now been in contact. We're starting to get in contact with people who have expressed um, views on that, and we will be following up on that, because I think you're right. Um, so far, we have been responding to what had been expressed as a data need. I think there's new needs which are being expressed or previously um, unexpressed needs to us, and we will be following up on that. Mm -hmm. And that's part of you know, the advice we take from the committee is who we should be involving, but also as the government minister, I want to make sure that that's as wide as possible. I do think there's a genuine issue, though, in terms of the, when we get to the mandatory question, 
and whether there's, it's binary or non-binary is if you're starting to define sex, that goes back to, to I think, Tavish's point, we've never actually defined that previously, and there could be biological sex, legal sex, etc. Um, the right to privacy in MD, answering that question, who might have difficulties in doing that, and that's something we just have to be uh, aware of. Well, indeed, but uh, as I say, the evidence we have received uh, in the committee, uh, you know, raises very significant questions, uh, you know, from many perspectives, yeah. that, se that sex does not permit of a non-binary option, uh, and that is a consistent theme of the evidence we have received. Uh, I therefore do find it a wee bit surprising that notwithstanding what would be a, a kind of at least accepted view, presumably, in society today amongst many uh, uh, people uh, with strong views, including experts, including data users, including statisticians, that it didn't perhaps occur to the National Register of Scotland that actually this might be kind of an issue. But anyway, uh, we are where we are, uh, uh, and it is good to hear that National Register of Scotland will now uh, speak to a, a much wider cohort of people who have useful uh, contributions to make uh, uh, to this debate. And obviously, as a committee, we will look forward to being uh, involved in that uh, process as well. If I can make just one other point briefly, Commissioner, which is on the issue that Claire Baker raised on, on the voluntary issue, which is the bill on uh, gender identity, it has been suggested by at least a couple of witnesses that actually, if, if you simply equated that with, with trans and trans history, that would be excluding other possible uh, individuals uh, and therefore uh, possibly having a non-exhaustive list under that kind of broad category and broad umbrella might be more helpful if we recall that the purpose of the census is to collect data which can be therefore useful for uh, planning for health and, and other public services so I, I just wonder what thought you know for perhaps officials could answer what thought has been given mm. to that because that certainly is a view that has been expressed to us in, in, in our evidence so Following up from the consultation, which had actually raised the issue of gender identity um, in subsequent conversations with stakeholders, it had been apparent that the actual need which was being expressed was around collecting information on transgender um, people. And that has certainly been the way that the, the work has gone so far. However, I think, um, again, I suppose, as I said to the last question, I think there's now been other issues raised. We have, up until now, in the testing that we've done, a question on gender identity, a broad question, has not necessarily tested very well and is less able to be understood, um, which I think probably, again, reflects the issues around terminology and an actual definition. But I think it is something as we um, start to follow up with more stakeholders, we will try and establish exactly, if we can, what that data need is. Now, there could be um, a range of needs there, but again, we will be bringing that back to the committee, I think, to, to explain what the need is and therefore any proposals which come back, why we're proposing the questions which we are. Okay, and last question, uh, very last question, brief question. So, in terms of where you are now with the testing, and you, you, it seems in the documentation you say you've been testing a non-binary question, given where we are now with the evidence before the committee. Is that something that you might pause uh, with? Because obviously you've still to hear from a whole host of other people about the efficacy of such an approach. Um, we've been testing non-binary questions, but we've also been testing binary questions. So it's not just been a non-binary yeah. uh, question that we've been testing. So I think we will be looking at going forward and reflecting from the evidence that's come in from the committee um, as to what actually needs to be tested going forward. Um, so I think we will be continuing to test with a range of um, questions. And also, I think picking up on something that was raised earlier, it's partly the interplay mm -hmm. of those questions. So we need to look at any proposed question which goes forward, whether it was binary or non-binary, how it then interplays with other proposed questions. Thank, thank you. you. Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, thank you very much. I think there's real concerns that you had some 15,000 uh, responses to consultation, and yet for the evidence, we've got a huge number of groups who represent women, which who are 52% of Scotland's population, feel they weren't adequately consulted. So the, the wee bit of going back to the drawing board on that, I think, is important. But, uh, but uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you've mentioned about you know sex never having been defined, but, uh, but in the 200 years of the census, I don't think it would have occurred to most people that there was anything other than male and female. Certainly, when I was growing up, I never thought of anybody as being other than male and female. And I do appreciate that society might have changed in terms of people's self-identification. But um, the evidence we've had, is, I think, has been quite conclusive on the fact that people are born uh, dimorphic, either male or female. And I would have thought that the first question should quite simply be what sex you are when you're born. And then you can go on to ask uh, voluntary questions subsequently. But one, one, one of the things that I've concerned about is you've talked about consistency with the 2011 census, but you know, two rights don't make a wrong. If self-identification 
actually was wrong then and shouldn't have been the question that was asked in, uh, uh, through the guidance. Surely we should change it now to make sure that we're much more specific and that people know what question they are being asked. Um, I appreciate your points, but that's obviously that's your view, and I think people have different views as to whether you know. I, mean, I don't think really you can say that the, the 2011 the 2011 census was wrong because I don't think it was wrong, um, but you can interpret whether that should have happened or not, and that's a, that would be an opinion. Um, and but that's the point of um, consulting the the committee, uh, and, and I think in terms of um, what we do going forward, it, it goes back to I think. Jamie's uh, Green's point is we've got to reflect society as, as it is, and of course it wouldn't have occurred to MD for perhaps, or it might have occurred to those that um, you know, were transgender, you know, over the the decades previously. But perhaps it, that, that recognition or understanding about how they would in, in, engage with the census might, you know, just wasn't just wasn't there. So you know, there will have been transgender people answering those questions for for many years. It's just because currently in society now we're just more conscious and more aware, um, you know, of the of the the, um, the society more generally is more un aware of the existence of trans transgender uh, people. So I think the kind of uh, the point about trying to capture the information as it is currently in 2021, we're not even there yet, and how society views things. But we have to make decisions now because we've got to, the, the timetable for processing this means to get the you know the orders that you have to see we've got to have the evidence etc and and that's why actually not defining <coughs> and, and just having it as male or female because um you know as you said there's biological sex there's legal sex there's no one definition but it's only nowadays that we're starting to identify that because actually your biological sex if somebody has a gender recognition certificate their legal sex will be different well, and, I mean, and you know, so therefore, you, it's it's not right to say that um, you know, we should never consider what male and female is, because actually we do now. My, but my instinct is um, is to try and keep it as simple as possible, and just to add, be consistent with what we've asked for the last two hundred years. I never said you shouldn't consider what people uh, feel and make their sex to be. What I said was that people it should identify people as at birth. But the Quality Act we're talking about, well, it's a protected characteristic of sex, and I quote, the Quality Act 2010 refers to sex in binary terms, man or woman, section 11. It defines woman as female of any age and man as male of any age. The use of sex in these definitions is generally understood in the biological sense. Yeah. However, if a trans woman has obtained a gender recognition certificate, she'll receive a new birth certificate stating she's female. This is despite being born biologically male. So... It's, the point is that, that uh, the 2011 census seemed to ignore that and basically it was people could self-identify. And I think the reason why so many women's groups have given evidence to us to express a concern about that is simply because they feel that there is a threat to women in a whole host of areas. And I won't, we won't get time to get them, but the, the evidence that we've taken um, uh, gives detail on that. Um, that... that uh, that self-declaration does threaten women, particularly, for example, women who get intimate care from people who, who may be trans, who've not self who, who are self-declaring, but in all other aspects are still biologically mm -hmm. male. No, I absolutely appreciate those points, and we can't retrofit where we were in 2011. Um, we've got to deal with where things are now, and mm -hmm. so the issues that, that have been brought to the attention of this committee are issues that are, um, are far more live and current now than they were in 2011 and so therefore we've got that that's where the responsibility at any point in time in the census is to well where where, where does the society stand now and what can we do to capture the information that we need now and also uh, we've now got the um in terms of the uh, public policy, the quality duties under uh, legislation that, that public bodies have to ensure that they're dealing with equality issues. So we've got a different position we are now than we were in 2011 for a whole variety of different areas. Um, but we also have to recognise that um, is there is there an opportunity? And this is, I, I suppose, I'm straying into the next stage of the the consultation. Whether you can you know, keep the clarity and simplicity of the male female question, have a voluntary a transgender um, status and history question um, and would that be satisfactory or if you don't want to conflate gender and, and, and sex it might be in the interest of some women's groups to have an opportunity to have an other part a non-binary part of the mandatory question to, to exactly do what you're, you're saying is you know separate out the gender issue from the sex issue and having the non-binary might also then help the equality representation that people can then say what they 
uh, what their, their view is um, and have that uh, as another. So that there are arguments for the non-binary question from both the women's group's perspective, because it separates out sex and gender, but potentially from the sexual, uh, from, from the, the, the equalities um, perspective. Where that might have problem is people then saying, well, hang on, you're either male or female, and that's it. We shouldn't have a, a, third, a, a third option there. So all I'm saying is that there are different views in diff from different perspectives in society and our role and our responsibility and that's you know collectively parliament and government is to steer a road that captures enough information that makes it credible have confidence that we're counting uh, and we're doing that in, in a way that is meaningful for those that have to use the data so i'm not saying it's yeah. easy uh, but you know there there are and this is a bit we'll get to in terms of looking at the mandatory question and what should be in it um as as to whether we uh, just have it as a uh, binary and rely on the transgender question to, you know, to, to, to the voluntary question to give us that uh, perspective of people who have a different gender identity from what the sex is defined as. With, with respect, though, though uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm, I'm not aware of any women's groups that are suggesting this should be, um, that the question should be anything, anything other than a binary question. I mean, I mean, if there are, I, I, don't, I don't know that they've been in touch with the, with the committee, but I th they all seem to be pretty consistent as far as as far as I'm aware. Yeah, and well, but that's what you have to reflect on the evidence you've given. But remember, the, 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 the call for evidence for this committee would have been, as the convener said right at the start, would have been about the you know, this the bill in front of us, which is about the voluntary questions. And if people have got choice of male, female, other, you know, people might just go, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll offer a laugh. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm not saying that in a facetious manner because, yeah. it, oh, oh, yeah. you know, was it 400,000 people in 2001 census wrote their religion down as Jedi? You know, I mean, it's, you know, so... Whereas if it's male or female, I think you will get a much more accurate figure. And then, as we say, as I think everyone in the committee agrees, we can voluntary questions about orientation and gender. I think that's a really important point because it's about the credibility. I go yeah. back to that point about credibility and confidence, and 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 that's why the testing is really important to see how people then respond to that and what you know is, it, is a temptation for people not to treat it as seriously as they should do because this is, uh, you know the census is so serious in terms of what the information it provides us. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank Alexander Sure. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, is there not a danger that by adding a third option of the sex question uh, that that would mean that the census data would not be comparable with the previous data that we'd had? And the whole idea about trying to sell, ensure that there's planning processes there uh, uh, to ensure that we have that information and that data is correct uh, and that is used in uh, many sectors, especially in the health sector, uh, to provide services? Uh, I'll, I'll bring in colleagues um, as well on this, but the, the point I said about it needing to be consistent is important, but I think you've already taken evidence um, from NHS saying in terms of usage that they use um, the sex information at a very high level, um, but we also anticipate MD uh, filling in either, even, even the, the voluntary transgender will be a small number. It wouldn't necessarily affect some of the global data that we need in terms of the sex question. Um, so I don't necessarily think it will, ne the, the, not being consistent would necessarily be an issue but um, in, in that regard but again that's statistical kind of uh, what you can project but I don't know if you want to come in on that area One area that obviously we haven't talked um, about yet partly because as we've said it, it's the next stage with, with the questions is around what we would actually output yes. so yes. if we ask a non-binary question I would say the, the big if that is obviously something for, for you um, to have a, um, the view on we would not be proposing and all the conversations with stakeholders to produce outputs on a non-binary basis. So we have always been consistent in our conversations with stakeholders. This is about allowing people to respond in a way which reflects how they identify. In terms of outputs, we would still um, produce outputs on a male and female Same. basis. We have discussed with stakeholder groups about the fact that what we would do was we would randomly assign people back into male and female, given that the numbers are expected to be very small and it won't affect okay. the statistical distributions, and that is seen to be acceptable. As long as we do that on a random basis and do not try and esta establish through other information that they've given whether we believe them to be male or female. But again, that is something that we're working, and we will continue to work going forward to see how, if that were to be um, the question that was asked, how we would then deal with that in outputs. Yeah, I, I think that's vitally important that you, that you identify that, because by, by, by doing that, uh, at least you're then uh, trying to tackle the situation, because otherwise it becomes much more complicated uh, and you can open up another can of worms in, in many respects as to what might take place. So, 
Can I just maybe say that that's the that that's the crux of the issue for the next stage, not this yeah. bill, but the next stage, is if you're not going to use the data, if you if you're not going to use non-binary data as non-binary data, you're only going to you, you're just going to use binary information. Why ask the question in the first place? Hmm. And the point is is to allow people who otherwise might not okay. feel comfortable responding to respond. Okay. And that is a decision that that, that has to be. Take it if you're not going to use, and, and, and I go back to the principles, it's got yeah. to be, it's, it's there, we're counting people for a purpose. That is the ma main purpose of the census. And so I think that's why we're getting into the, if you're not counting them for a purpose, why count, them, count in that way? And therefore, we then come back to the, the societal um, point uh, is, should we enable, um, should the census be such to allow responses, even if you're not necessarily going to use that response information in a data purpose? So actually, keeping it simple, is more reliable um, and actually reflects what your usage, but it doesn't necessarily reflect how people might want to contribute in filling it in exactly. in the per first place. And that is the advice. Um, I'd be very welcome okay. to hear from the committee as to what your priorities are yeah. in in, in, in us determining that next stage, which is the mandatory. And I think I think that's quite important. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, You've mentioned a couple of times that there has not, uh, even prior to 2011, been a, a specific narrow definition of the, of the sex question, uh, whether in relation to a biological characteristic or, or any other uh, specific characteristic. And I think it's just important to draw out the fact that the, the guidance in 2011 was not a departure, was not a change, but rather a clarification of the way that the census has always operated. Uh, and that being the case, I, um, I wonder if you've seen uh, the evidence that's been submitted from a, a coalition of national women's uh, equality and violence against women organisations, including uh, prominent, well-respected organisations, uh, Scottish Women's Aid, uh, Engender, Rape Crisis Scotland and others. Uh, they say they have a long history of, of deliberation on the interrelationship between trans equality and rights and women's equality and rights. Uh, and quite unlike the, um, the, 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 the representation that was made earlier, uh, suggesting that a, a huge number of women's organisations uh, were expressing concerns and felt un, uh, uninvolved in this. They say, we're engaged with the census process in our work. Our view was and remains that the proposals as consulted upon will have little impact on gender, uh, gendered data gathering and analysis. Um, but they do say, we were concerned to hear calls to the committee to reverse the practice uh, of the census 2011 and 2001 and mandate respondents to describe their sex at birth. They say they were concerned about that. They say they weren't aware of any problems with the, the current uh, approach, the historic approach, uh, and that uh, trans individuals responding to the, uh, the, the question on sex with details of their lived identity, this, mm -hmm. this coalition feels that's appropriate doesn't cause problems, and they say in most instances this will accurately reflect how a broad range of public bodies and providers of goods, facilities and services will understand and treat them, uh, and that to, to have a departure from this would cause problems in relation to breach of privacy. Does the government agree with that analysis and share that position? And in particular, does the government agree with the, the suggestion that for most trans people, uh, their uh, lived identity uh, is most closely relevant to the way most data users for the census will engage with them and and uh, and, and treat them in respective services um, I understand that I haven't read that particular um, correspondence or evidence to the committee but we'll make a point of doing so I think it, it runs somewhat counter to some of the um, other points being made by the committee about some of women's groups that have given evidence and, and representation, and that's part of the consultation that's taking place that currently with the NRS in, in relation to getting on to the next stage or mandatory. So, you know, that's the point about you know what's lived experience as opposed to biological or legal sex, and that's why um, I think the guidance was the way it was in in, in 2011. Um, but we we're not dealing with the 2011 census; we're dealing with mm -hmm. census preparations. 
now. Um, and you know, I'm, I, I, the importance for the government is to make sure this is not the census doesn't lead to public opinion. The census has to reflect society as it is just now mm. and ask questions that maximises the response rate um, effectively, um, so it can be used. Uh, but I appreciate the points that have been made, and, and and I think that's what we probably have to get to the nub of is in terms of uh, women's groups in particular and uh, different organisations. Um, you know, what is the what are the issues that they really want to get at, and how 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 much um, concern there is in relation to um, you know, self-identification and what that means. But this, the, this is not the bill that should resolve these issues. No. These issues should be resolved somewhere else. And that's why I think we've got to be you know, very clear in terms of what we're trying to do here is we want the census to count people and yeah. we want it to be credible and have confidence. And that, to me, is the primary thing. For my, so I'm not taking a government view as to whether people are right or wrong in yeah. saying these things. All I'm saying is my, it's almost like a guardianship we've got the census. And that's my role is to make sure that it's as credible, it has confidence, that it counts people and that there is a consistency that we can, we can use data properly. In, indeed. And it is a, a, a 10 yearly population level snapshot. It's, it's not about recording individual information no. like, a, like a national identity database, which no. I think most of us would, would oppose on, on principle. Um, if the government continues, uh, as I, I would suggest, to, to stick with the, the historic uh, situation in which the, the mandatory sex question uh, is answered uh, by each individual honestly on their own terms, uh, rather than defined in relation to one characteristic, um, and the government also decides not to have an other category, how should a non-binary person answer that binary question? Would, is there not a fundamental problem if we maintain this, uh, this position that, that people answer that question on sex honestly in their own terms, but don't include uh, an other option? Do, do, we not, do we not inevitably risk uh, people feeling that they have to give inaccurate information? Well, that's the point about you know allowing responders to respond accurately, which mm. I think was the point that Alexander Stewart was was making. Um, I think that most people, as you've expressed, would want to answer that question and how they uh, how they live, as opposed to necessarily their sex at birth or indeed their legal sex. But that's why the extrapolation of the voluntary question on transgender status would allow us to actually then take that information out to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. But that's the balancing act that we'll have to come to. And we've not determined that yet. And that's why you know we're engaging with the committee and we want to engage earlier than has previously been in the 2011 status uh, census to get that to get that view as to where the committee is on that so Thank you. you know there is something about keeping it the way it's been previously but there are new issues that have been brought to the attention of the committee and we've got to take your view as that that balance it and particularly i think the convener's point about women's groups and you know i haven't seen this um other collective letter um and that i presume that's been submitted into it, the committee has, as well yeah. And a, Betty's website. And, yeah. ju and just finally, um, in the, the letter from NRS on the 5th of December, which, as far as I understand it, uh, is the first point at which the suggestion uh, of changing the, 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 the reference to gender identity uh, to one uh, about trans status was suggested, and the, the, the idea of being open to that, that change was in the letter on the, on the 5th yeah. uh, of December. If that is an active consideration, if that's an ongoing consideration, would there be any potential problems uh, if amendments were made to the bill that restricted the kind of question that can be asked? Uh, is, is there a change that has to happen, or is it more the question that we need to resist making restrictive changes to the bill uh, that, would, that would close down that, that consideration of the options? Uh, I, I don't think it... I, I don't, well, I, I don't think in legal. This is why we'll have to, you know, reflect on this as to, you know, what changes. And this is the stage two part. You know, what changes mm. could be made to give clarity, which I think that's what everybody's wanting to and, you know, wanting to see. Um, that you know, and we've we've always been quite clear that the questions that we're wanting to ask about, unless, unless you're about to tell us otherwise, it's not the questions that we wanted to ask is about trans, transgender status and, and and history. And if that's what we want to ask on a voluntary basis, we might be able to just be explicit about that. That's exactly what we'll ask. In the, in you know, in the um, in, in terms of the drafting, and that's where the amendments at stage two could be to, to limit it to that. I don't think that would limit us in any other way because the irony is, it's the mandatory. We could ask the mandatory questions. Um, we could actually ask anything. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it's far more flexibility and scope. Mm-hmm. So actually, all we're trying to do is to protect people from being fined or committing an offence yeah. um, by as- answering those questions. So I don't think limiting it in the suggestions I think was made earlier on, I think by the convener itself, herself in, in relation to restricting that uh, wording to transgender status and, and history, that wouldn't. Rest- I don't think that would unnecessarily restrict us unless our lawyers would tell me otherwise, but that might be something we need to respond in writing to the committee about. Yeah, I think that's something that we should um, consider further down the line. It's not it, not for this moment in time to do, mm-hmm. to discuss the specific effects of specific changes um, or suggested amendments to the bill. That's something that we consider going forward into stage two. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, just for clarity, yeah. in the Equality yeah. Network's own submission to the committee, when they suggested including trans uh, trans status, yeah. they they said in their submission they 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 did not think that that would pin down the question and that the consultation process was open to further develop that question. That yeah. didn't seem to be a concern of theirs. Yeah. Uh, um, I think we're just having the, ca- the, the caution of lawyers in the room, I think, is, is probably what we have, yeah. but that's my, my understanding as well. Okay, Stuart McMillan. Uh, no, thank you. Um, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I was on the committee uh, ten years ago that went through the, uh, this ah. process, so <laughs> there had to be one. There had to be one. <laughs> All will be revealed. Um, uh, but genuinely, I, I, I found this process to be, uh, it has been helpful. Right. Uh, you mentioned earlier on regarding the front loading uh, on, yeah. on some issues, yeah. and, and I generally think it actually has been helpful in, in what uh, this committee has been doing and certainly teasing out some of the particular issues for the actual next stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, there's been a, a number of uh, points have been raised uh, in terms of evidence. Uh, but certainly last week we heard um, some issues regarding the, the guidance that was available for 2011 and uh, the direction uh, of people to, to the online guidance. Mm-hmm. Um, has any consideration been given to that to, so when we do get to the next stage of the actual census itself, to actually have a, a potentially a, what, an improved process? Uh, and uh, to make more people aware of that online guidance is yeah. actually good. Um, well, I think the, the one thing about um, the guidance is obviously, I've said, different questions come and go, and, and the guidance is very important, but also for particular groups, and you remember the language issue, there was a lot of um, particular um, stakeholder groups that were trying to encourage people to answer that question. Yeah. So therefore, you know, there was a, quite a lot of activity around the, that as a new question and what that meant and how people should engage. And that's what we'd also want, particularly in the voluntary question on transgender, to encourage people to, um, um, to you know, to, to, to fill that in so that, you know, in terms of getting that information, we've got some, some information on that. Um, but your point about guidance, I think, what, again, what this process has, has identified is, um, although the bill itself, in a sense, is... is is straightforward because it's about the voluntary aspects. The next stage is the, the more complicated aspect because it will be about the mandatory questioning and that will be very detailed. But alongside that is the guidance within that. And I think this process and the evidence sessions has shown that the 2011 guidance was obviously something that came along, you know, I think during the process of, of, of that census development, but it's obviously clearly very important. So in terms of our transparency and engagement with the committee, I think it's really important that we ensure that the guidance that's there is given the you know attention that it deserves and to make sure that some of the issues potentially controversial or indeed otherwise that the guidance is given as much importance as, as uh, you know as actually the questions itself so that there is that transparency. So I think your your advice on that I think is well taken. No, thank you. Um, and it's a second question, it's, it's in a, kind of a different aspect, uh, so hopefully the convener will allow me. Uh, just that you mentioned earlier on regarding that the census will actually be mostly uh, online, but uh, in terms of uh, other uh, uh, other people in society, uh, particularly people who maybe have a visual impairment, um, I take it there will still be uh, copies uh, of the census in paper copy, but also in various other formats, including Braille. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is something um, we are, uh, in fact, even picking up your last point, we are continue. We will be continually testing um, with um, individuals, with groups as well, to make sure that all the information that we provide is accessible, um, is easy to understand, and um, we are fully working alongside um, equality groups and um, groups that represent um, people with different needs to make sure that what we're doing is actually appropriate for them. Okay, no, that's helpful. I thought I'd pose that question. I chair the cross party group on visual impairment. Yeah, yeah, no, very important. And and uh, I would say, convener, obviously, there's there's different aspects of the census. We're focusing on particular issues in relation to the voluntary 
questions, sexual orientation, transgender, and obviously we've touched a great deal on the mandatory question on sex, but there's an awful lot else around the census, so we, I, we want to make sure that there's an offer to the committee to make sure that we keep you up to date about the whole the whole project itself. Yeah. We would appreciate that. Is that you? Yeah, Finish that's your questions. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just to, to conclude, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, Patrick Harvey mentioned the number of women's organisations that had written collectively under the, the I think, on the umbrella of engender. In that particular submission, they did raise issues about of concern about how public bodies collect data on protected characteristics, <coughs> uh, and they be they believed that there was a lot of um, confusion out there that sex is a protected characteristic, and it's defined as Kenneth. Uh, Gibson said earlier it's defined by the Equality Act as is gender reassignment as a protected characteristic. In the equality um, impact assessment uh, for uh, the this, this Census Amendment Bill, the, the NRS actually dealt with sex and gender reassignment under the same heading and mainly talked about gender reassignment. And it contrasts very sharply uh, with the ONS um, equality impact assessment, which dealt with those two protected characteristics separately. Um, do you <coughs> acknowledge that there is perhaps some work to be done across government and in your department to make sure that every area of government and all public bodies are adhering to their obligations under the Equality Act to deal with sex as a protected characteristic? independently of gender reassignment? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, and I think across government we can always be improving, and I think the exercise in this in this process has identified that as well. However, I would say that the equality statement for this bill is about this bill, and this bill is about <coughs> transgender ge gender identity. It's not actually about sex, so therefore um, it's, it's not about the mandatory question on sex, it's not about the sex issue, it's actually about uh, gender reassignment effectively and gender status, which would be captured by the voluntary question and sexual orientation. So the equality statement would be in relation to the bill in front of us, not about the census process generally. And finally, um, again, I welcome the fact that you're going back to uh, various groups yeah. um, to gather views. You'll be aware that there are differences of opinions, in, even within uh, lesbian and gay communities. There are many lesbian and gays, uh, people who have got concerns, for example, about self-identification. Um, and there are women's groups who disagree with some of the comments made in the, uh, the submission that Patrick Harvey mentioned, and they have made submissions to our committee. Can you give us assurances that you will take all those views into account? You won't just go to certain, uh, what you might call the usual suspects, who are yeah. funded by government and whose money depends on them taking a particular position on these issues? I hear what the convener says, and I think it's really important that we have as wide a uh, consultation as possible when we get to the next stage, which is determining the final questions and the actual content of that. Um, I think you're right in saying a lot of people have different views and opinions, but you know, if you take on everybody's views and opinions, you still have to come to a judgment at some point, and that's why I hope I've given you some um, perspective that I really, at the end of the day, as you know, the guardian of the census, it's got to be credible, have confidence. Uh, count people and to have some consistency. So we're not going to be able to please everybody in this, um, but we have to, you know, I think it is a snapshot in time and we're going to have to make sure and, and determine the questions based on that snapshot in time as to yeah. where society is. And that's why I don't think, you know, as one individual, although I'm the responsible minister, um, you know, I would have to make, you know, final decisions. I, I really need to do so with the advice of this committee because, you know, you, you can help me do that. And um, I very much appreciate your consideration in doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and with that, we will close the meeting and move into private session. Thank you.